differential action upon the sexes of forces which tend to segregate the feeble-minded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tricia G. Differential Action Upon the Sexes of Forces Which Tend to Segregate the Feeble-Minded by Lita S. Hollingworth Teachers College, Columbia University First published in Journal of Abnormal Psychology and Social Psychology, Volume 17, pages 35 to 57. 1. Previous Observations It has been often stated that among individuals of the lowest two or three percentiles in the distribution of human intelligence, there are more males than females. This statement has been based chiefly on the census of state training schools for mental defectives, and of special classes for subnormal children. Such enumerations practically always show a preponderance of males. Kuhlman, footnote, Kuhlman F., the part played by the state institutions in the care of the feeble-minded, Journal of Psychoasthenics, 1916, and footnote, gives figures, which may serve us as fair samples, collected by him in 1915, as the result of a questionnaire returned from seven states in this country. In the state schools for feeble-minded were 4,046 males, 53.5 percent, and 3,518 females, 46.5 percent. The United States report for 1910 showed in institutions for the feeble-minded 11,015 males, 53.8 percent, and 9,716 females, 46.2 percent. Special classes for subnormal children in local school districts also show more boys than girls on the registers. The reports of the Inspector of Ungraded Classes in New York City show a ratio of more than two boys to one girl. Recent reports from England show three boys to two girls on the records of the Special Schools After Care Committee of the City of Birmingham, Footnote. Report of the Education Committee, City of Birmingham, England, quoted in School and Society, October 22, 1921, and footnote, a ratio, quote, which is frequently found in the various special schools for the mentally defective, end quote. From reports of which those cited are fair samples, inferences like the following are drawn, quote, Idiocy is almost everywhere recognized as more common in males than in females. End quote. Footnote Ellis H. Man and Woman, 1909 edition. End footnote. Quote, there is no doubt that there are more feeble minded boys than girls. There are more boys in the special classes in London, and in the Helfschulen in Germany, and in the special classes so far found in the United States, and everything agrees with this. End quote. Footnote. Goddard, H. H., 2,000 Normal Children Measured by the Binet Measuring Scale, Pedagogical Seminary, 1911. End footnote. In working among the children in the special classes for mental defectives in Philadelphia, Sylvester's, footnote, Sylvester R., The Form Board, Psychological Monographs, 1913. End footnote. Noticed that when mental tests were made by him, the girls of these classes were revealed as more defective than the boys, though fewer in number, and he commented as follows, quote, For reasons not of interest here, a relatively small number of girls are placed in the special backward classes. It is a matter of observation, confirmed by these results, in mental tests, that the girls of these classes as a group are more backward than the boys. Obviously the girls of a mental grade corresponding to the brighter boys in the backward classes were left in the regular classes, end quote. Reference should here be made to the findings of the Royal Commission of Great Britain of 1904, footnote. Treadgold A. Mental Deficiency, William Wood and Company, New York, 1920, end footnote. This commission sought to enumerate the feeble-minded outside of institutions, by sampling certain sections of the country and applying a social-economic criterion to the inhabitants. The definition of feeble-minded person, which they adopted, was, quote, one who is capable of making a living under favorable circumstances, 
but is incapable from mental defect existing from birth or from an early age a of competing on equal terms with his normal fellows or b of managing himself and his affairs with ordinary prudence end quote. upon application of this criterion the commission found more feeble-minded males than females but there is every reason to suppose that this criterion applies unequally to the sexes. The same supposition holds for their definitions of imbecile and idiot. Within the last five years, fairly large samplings of school children, chosen as nearly as possible at random, have been measured objectively for intelligence, with results which are not consistently the same. Terman, footnote, Terman, L. M., the Measurement of Intelligence, Houghton Mifflin, Boston, 1916, and footnote, found no sex difference in numbers of the very stupid identified in measuring 905 school children selected at random. Pressy, footnote, Pressy L. W., sex differences shown by 2,544 school children on a group scale of intelligence with special reference to variability, Journal of Applied Psychology, 1918. End footnote. In testing a random sampling of 2,544 schoolchildren in Indiana, found boys to be more variable and to preponderate among the very stupid. In another sample of 1,408 schoolchildren, the same investigators found a similar result, while in a sample of 787 children, limited to the ages of 12 and 13 years, no sex difference in variability was found but boys preponderated among the very low scores, girls preponderating at the opposite extreme. Fraser, footnote, Fraser, G.W., Sex Differences in Mental Traits and in School Achievement, Master's Essay, Stanford University, 1919, and footnote. In mental tests of 1,550 unselected school children in California, found no sex difference in variability, and no preponderance of inferior intelligence among boys. Studies by means of educational and mental measurement made previous to 1914, which bear upon the question of sex differences in intellectual deviation, have been reviewed elsewhere by the present writer, footnote, Hollingworth L.S., Variability as Related to Sex Differences in Achievement, American School of Sociology, 1914, and footnote and will not be noted here. In general, these studies were based on inadequate samplings, and yielded no conclusive results. 2. Aim of the present investigation. The present investigation proposes, 1. To throw additional light upon the question of the frequency of extreme deviations in intelligence, as related to sex. 2. To pass upon the validity of the census of the segregated, as a measure of sex differences in mental variation, and three, to give an account of the extent to which segregation may be differential as it affects boys and girls. The method is to analyze large samplings respectively of those who are brought for mental examination because they are thought to be deficient, and of those who have been actually segregated. As preliminary to the collection of data, the following specific questions were formulated. 1. Are males and females brought in equal numbers from the general population for examination as suspected mental defectives? 2. Are males and females committed in equal numbers to institutions for mental defectives? 3. Are males and females brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives, and those committed as such, equally distributed in birthday age? 4. Are males and females so brought, and those so committed, of equal birthday age, mental age for mental age? 5. Are males and females so brought, and those so committed, equally stupid, age for age? 6. What inferences are to be drawn from a census of the segregated regarding the relative frequency of extremely low intelligence as related to sex? 3. Material of the present investigation. The present writer undertook the investigation of some of the above propounded questions first in 1913, and in that year some of the data here included were published. Footnote. Hollingworth, L.S. The Frequency of Amentia as Related to Sex, Medical Record, 1913. 
and footnote. The material was, therefore, gathered in two separate parts at two different times as follows. 1. In 1913, 1,000 consecutive cases of suspected mental deficiency were transcribed from the files of the Clearing House for Mental Defectives at the Postgraduate Hospital in New York City. This was a public clinic from which children or adults, if found to be feeble-minded, might be officially committed to appropriate institutions. Individuals of any age from any borough of Greater New York, if suspected of inadequate intelligence, were admissible to this clinic for mental examination. Measurement of intelligence was made at that time by means of Goddard's revision of Binet's measuring scale. The mental examinations were made by psychologists duly appointed to serve on this clinic, among whom was the present writer, who made about one-third of the measurements recorded here. Of the 1,000 consecutive cases tabulated, 117 had no record of mental measurement, because of sensory defect, language difficulty, non-cooperation, and so forth. 2. In 1921, 1,142 cases were taken from the official files of the psychological laboratory in the institution maintained by the Department of Public Welfare of New York City, called the Children's Hospital of Randall's Island. This is the municipal institution for the detention of the feeble-minded. The mentally defective of the city are received here without limitations as to age, and receive training in the schools conducted there, though the institution is called the Children's Hospital, the great majority of inmates being children of school age, as will be seen from the data presented. The data here used were obtained by transcribing all commitments, resident at any time since the establishment of the psychological laboratory, alphabetically by surname, through A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. All cases falling under these categories were transcribed in order, both those who were inmates at the time of transcription, and those who had been inmates, except epileptics, and those whose mental tests were incomplete. The latter were cases either just admitted to the island, or too ill to be brought for mental examination, and were distributed in chance proportion between the sexes. The method of mental measurement was the Stanford Binet, in about 90% of cases, the remainder having been measured by Goddard's revision of Binet's scale, by Pintner's scale of performance tests, or by Kuhlman's extension of Binet's measuring scale. The last named was used in grading cases under three years mentally. The mental measurements were made by the psychologists duly appointed to serve in the psychological laboratory after civil service examination or by assistance directly under their supervision. These two distinct collections of data may be regarded as check samples for each other. In each case, the date, 1913 or 1921, refers to the year in which the transcription of cases was made. There are certain reasons for supposing that the results here obtained from the study of segregated cases might differ somewhat from those obtained from a study of all segregated mental defectives in the state. The institution studied is located in a city, and there probably is a tendency to send boys and men to country institutions where they can work upon the land. More males than females are transferred to upstate schools, as the files show. It seems highly probable that more males may be sent to the country in the first place, since that is permissible. Again, the state maintains a separate institution for feeble-minded women of child-bearing age, and this may affect somewhat the number of women of that age found in this study of inmates. 1921 data. These possible selective influences do not, however, affect the data from those brought for examination, 1913, as these cases were uncommitted at the time of examination. 4. Comparative incidence of males and of females in the samples studied. Are males and females brought in equal numbers for mental examination as suspected mental defectives? Are males and females segregated in equal numbers in an institution for mental defectives? Of the 1,000 consecutive individuals examined in the clearing house for mental defectives, 568 were males and 432 were females. Of the 1,142 cases listed in the Randalls Island Institution alphabetically, 
603 were males and 539 were females. The preponderance of males brought for examination is greater than the preponderance of males actually segregated here, probably for two reasons. The first of these is that already mentioned, namely, that there may be a tendency to commit males to state schools where agriculture is possible. The second probability is that considerable numbers of the males presented are not committed, because they are found on test to be of a status higher than that where commitment can be justified. It is true that more males than females are born, in a proportion of about 106 to 100. Footnote. Williams J. W. Obstetrics, D. Appleton and Company, New York, 4th edition, 1917. Rauber A. Der Überschuss an Nabegenburten u Sein Biologisch Bedutung, A. Georgi, Leipzig, 1900. End footnote. Statistics of mortality, however, show a somewhat higher death rate among male infants, so that by adolescence the numerical equality of the sexes is usually considered to be established. No statistics are available to the present writer from which the exact numerical ratio of the sexes at each birthday age in New York City, over the decade studied, can be learned. The federal census in 1910 gave a proportion of 1,029 males to 1,000 females in New York City, and in 1920 gave the proportion as 998 males to 1,000 females. The preponderance of males examined, and the preponderance of males segregated, in New York City, is greater at any rate from the preponderance of males born, or living in New York City during the time studied, as follows. 5. Comparative age of males and females in the samples studied. Are males and females brought for mental examination as suspected moral defectives, and those committed as such, equally distributed in birthday age? Proportion of males to females born, 106 to 100. Proportion of males to females living in New York City, 1910, 1,029 to 1,000. Proportion of males to females living in New York City, 1920, 998 to 1,000. Proportion of males to females examined, 1913, 130 to 100. Proportion of males to females committed, 1921, 112 to 100. This question is answered in the tables and graphs immediately following. Table 1, Parts 1 and 2, showing the distribution of males and females by birthday age examined consecutively in New York City as suspected mental defectives, 1913, and as detained in an institution for mental defectives in New York City, 1921. Birthday age, years, 0 to 1. Presented for examination, 1913, males 3, females 1. Segregated, 1921, males 0, females 0. Age, 1 to 2. Presented for examination, 1913, males 5, females 5. Segregated, 1921, males 3, females 0. Age, 2 to 3. Presented for examination, males 12, females 7. Committed, males 5, females 6. Age 3 to 4. Presented for examination, males 13, females 10. Committed, males 14, females 7. Age 4 to 5. Presented for examination, males 19, females 12. Committed, males 20, females 11. Age 5 to 6. Presented for examination, males 20, females 13. Committed, males 25, females 14. Age 6 to 7. Presented for examination, males 22, females 13. Committed, males 23, females 7. Age 7 to 8. Presented for examination, males 25, females 16. Committed, males 27, females 20. Age, 8 to 9. Presented for examination, males 33, females 18. Committed, males 29, females 21. Age, 9 to 10. Presented for examination, males 32, females 18. 
committed, males 34, females 14. Age, 10 to 11. Presented for examination, males 46, females 21. Committed, males 39, females 21. Age, 11 to 12. Presented for examination, males 46, females 17. Committed, males 27, females 21. Age, 12 to 13. Presented for examination, males 52, females 39. Committed, males 33, females 33. Age, 13 to 14. Presented for examination, males 57, females 25. Committed, males 43, females 22. Ages 14 to 15. Presented for examination, males 59, females 24. Committed, males 43, females 43. Age 15 to 16. Presented for examination, males 46, females 34. Committed, males 43, females 33. Age 16 to 17. Presented for examination, males 17, females 29. Committed, males 22, females 33. Age 17 to 18. Presented for examination, males 15, females 21. Committed, males 18, females 27. Age 18 to 19. Presented for examination, males 10, females 15. Committed, males 18, females 17. Age 19 to 20. Presented for examination, males 5, females 17. Committed, males 9, females 24. Age 20 to 21. Presented for examination, males 6, females 7. Committed, males 6, females 20. Age 21 to 22. Presented for examination, males 3, females 13. Committed, males 11, females 13. Age 22 to 23. Presented for examination, males 1, females 7. Committed, males 11, females 7. Age 23 to 24. Presented for examination, males 1, females 6. Committed, males 7, females 10. Age 24 to 25. Presented for examination, Males 2, females 5, committed, males 7, females 13. Age 25 to 26, presented for examination, males 2, females 5, committed, males 9, females 9. Age 26 to 27, presented for examination, males 3, females 0, committed, males 4, females 5. Age 27 to 28, Presented for examination, males 2, females 1, committed, males 3, females 5. Age 28 to 29, presented for examination, males 2, females 5, committed, males 4, females 9. Age 29 to 30, presented for examination, males and females 0, committed, males 4, females 4. Age 30 to 31, Presented for examination, males 1, females 3, committed, males 4, females 9. Age 31 to 32, presented for examination, males 2, females 2, committed, males 4, females 4. Age 32 to 33, presented for examination, males 1, females 4, committed, males 4, females 5. Age 33 to 34, Presented for examination, males 0, females 3, committed, males 4, females 4. Age 34 to 35, presented for examination, males 0, females 1, committed, males 4, females 3. Age 35 to 36, presented for examination, males 1, females 4, committed, males 7, females 3. Age 36 to 37, Presented for examination, males 0, females 1. Committed, males 2, females 5. Age 37 to 38. Presented for examination, males 1, females 2. Committed, males 2, females 5. Age 38 to 39. Presented for examination, 
males and females zero. Committed, males five, females three. Age thirty nine to forty. Presented for examination, males one, females two. Committed, males three, females three. Age forty to forty one. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males three, females zero. Age forty one to forty two. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males one, females two. Age forty two to forty three. Presented for examination, males zero, females one. Committed, males one, females four. Age forty three to forty four. Presented for examination, males one, females one. Committed, males six, females three. Age forty four to forty five. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males two, females zero. Age forty five to forty six. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males two, females six. Age forty six to forty seven. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males one, females three. Age forty seven to forty eight. Presented for examination, males one, females zero. Committed, males zero, females four. Age forty eight to forty nine. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males and females zero. Age forty nine to fifty. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males one, females two. Age fifty to fifty one. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males one, females three. Age fifty one to fifty two. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males and females zero. Age fifty two to fifty three. Presented for examination, males zero, females one. Committed, males zero, females one. Age fifty three to fifty four. Presented for examination, males and females zero. Committed, males zero, females one. Age fifty four to fifty five. Presented for examination, males zero, females one. Committed, Males zero, females zero. Age fifty five to fifty six. Committed, males zero, females one. Age fifty six to fifty seven. Committed, males one, females zero. Age fifty seven to fifty eight. Committed, males one, females zero. Age fifty eight to fifty nine. Committed, males one, females two. Age fifty nine to sixty, zero. Age sixty to sixty one zero, age sixty one to sixty two committed males zero females one. Figure one presenting graphically the facts recorded in Table One Part One, showing the comparative frequency of males and females among one thousand consecutive cases of supposed mental deficiency by birthday age. Figure three presenting graphically the facts of Table Two Part One showing that females of a given mental status escape mental examination longer than do males of the same status. Figure 2. Presenting graphically the facts recorded in Table 1, Part 2, showing the comparative frequency of males and females among 1,142 individuals segregated as mental defectives by birthday age. From the data, it is clearly seen that the preponderance of males is due to the presence of boys under 16 years of age. Males are brought for examination and are segregated at a relatively early age. Girls escape the pressure that brings about identification longer than do boys. It is obvious that many women who were in childhood of a status warranting segregation escaped until the age of 20 or 30 years or longer in ways which are not open to boys and men in question. Since many die before the age of sixteen years, it follows that many females escaping examination and segregation at the ages when males are most frequently examined and committed never come under those influences which cause the curves of distribution to cross at sixteen years because they have died in the meantime. Also, there is no reason to suppose that factors which finally become operative to bring feeble-minded girls for examination and commitment after sixteen years of age 
are equal in pressure to those which bring feeble-minded boys before sixteen. Even if all the feeble-minded live to be just seventy years old, let us say, there is no reason to suppose that as many females as males would be ultimately identified by present social pressures. Our second question relating to comparative age is this. Are males and females brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives, and those so committed, of equal birthday age, mental age for mental age? Table 2, Part 1 showing that females are older chronologically, mental age for mental age, than are males, brought for examination as suspected mental defectives in New York City, 1913. Mental age years, 0 to 4. Birthday age at examination, males, average, 7.1, absolute deviation, 3.2, cases, 92. Females, average, 8.1, Absolute deviation, 3.8, cases 65. Mental age, 4 to 5. Males, average, 9.2. Absolute deviation, 2.4, cases 29. Females, average, 11.4. Absolute deviation, 4.3, cases 16. Mental age, 5 to 6. Males, average, 12.6. Absolute deviation, 4.2, Cases 25. Females. Average 13.2. Absolute deviation 4.3. Cases 32. Mental age 6 to 7. Males. Average 11.4. Absolute deviation 2.9. Cases 42. Females. Average 15.8. Absolute deviation 6.0. Cases 40. Mental age 7 to 8. Males, average, 13.5, absolute deviation, 2.9, cases, 76. Females, average, 15.0, absolute deviation, 4.6, cases, 45. Mental age, 8 to 9. Males, average, 12.9, absolute deviation, 2.5, cases, 82. Females, average, 17.2. Absolute deviation 5.1. Cases 56. Mental age 9 to 10. Males average 14.0. Absolute deviation 2.7. Cases 70. Females average 17.3. Absolute deviation 4.3. Cases 53. Mental age 10 to 11. Males average 15.2. Absolute deviation 2.7, cases 57. Females, average 18.5. Absolute deviation 5.4, cases 46. Mental age 11 to 12. Males, average 14.2. Absolute deviation 1.0, cases 20. Females, average 17.7. Absolute deviation 2.5, cases 27. Mental age 12 plus. Males average 13.0. Absolute deviation 0. Cases 4. Females average 16.8. Absolute deviation 2.9. Cases 6. Table 2, Part 2. Showing that females are older chronologically, mental age for mental age, than are males committed to an institution for mental defectives in New York City, 1921. Mental age years, below 3. Birthday age as examined in institution committed cases, males average 11.3, absolute deviation 7.6, cases 154. Females average 11.7, absolute deviation 6.7, cases 111. Mental age 3 to 4, males average 14.0, absolute deviation 8.5, Cases 66. Females average 16.5. Absolute deviation 9.6. Cases 47. Mental age 4 to 5. Males average 13.0. Absolute deviation 6.0. Cases 51. Females average 16.7. Absolute deviation 7.6. Cases 38. Mental age 5 to 6. Males average 18.7, absolute deviation 9.4, cases 
cases 42 females average 19.2 absolute deviation 9.1 cases 52 mental age 6 to 7 males average 18.0 absolute deviation 8.7 cases 66 females average 21.5 absolute deviation 8.6 cases 95 mental age 7 to 8 males average 16.2 absolute deviation 5.5 cases 72 females average 22.7 absolute deviation 9.3 cases 64 mental age 8 to 9 males average 16.2 absolute deviation 5.0 cases 74 females average 19.7 absolute deviation 7.0 cases 64 mental age 9 to 10 Males average 15.7, absolute deviation 3.0, cases 35. Females average 20.1, absolute deviation 7.0, cases 37. Mental age 10 to 11. Males average 17.6, absolute deviation 5.7, cases 22. Females average 20.6, absolute deviation 6.3 cases 26 mental age 11 plus males average 18.0 absolute deviation 6.1 cases 21 females average 19.8 absolute deviation 4.2 cases 5 figure 4 presenting graphically the facts of table 2 part 2 showing that females of a given mental status escape segregation longer than do males of the same status from Table 2, Parts 1 and 2, it is clear that females who survive in the ordinary schools and in society till past the age of adolescence do not do so because they are of better mentality than the corresponding males. Females of any given mental age escape examination and segregation longer than do males of the same mental age, this difference becoming very marked above the mental age of six to seven years. A female with a mental age of six years has as good a chance to survive inconspicuously in the educational, social, and economic milieu of New York City as does a male of mental age of ten years. That a greater age of females at each mental age does not result simply from greater longevity of females is clear from the distributions in figures one and two. 6. Comparative stupidity of males and females in the samples studied. Are males and females, brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives, and those so segregated, equally stupid, age for age? In seeking the answer to this question, the IQs have been distributed by sex and by birthday age, and the average IQ under each birthday age has been found for each sex separately. Also, the IQs have been distributed by sex, disregarding birthday age. IQ is here taken to mean the ratio between birthday age and mental age, by whatever scale of measurement was used. In almost all of the cases here distributed, the scale was either Stanford Binet, 1921, or Goddard's Revision, 1913. In these tabulations, a difficulty arises through the lack of exact measurement below the level of three years. As before stated, a few cases testing below three had been measured by Kuhlman's method, and the IQs for these can be included. All who remained unmeasured, being listed in the records simply as below three, were omitted from the distributions. Very few of the children sufficiently stupid to be presented or segregated early register as high as three mentally by their sixth birthday. Not enough children under seven by birthday age registered three or more mentally, so that distribution of IQs under that age would be worth while. The calculations begin, therefore, with the seven-year-olds. There is no reason to suppose that the comparison would result differently if all individuals below three mentally could be included in the distribution of IQs. More males than females are below three in mental age, but this does not mean that there are more very low-grade intelligences among the males. Inspection of Table 4 will show that more of the males than of the females below three mentally are relatively young children so that their IQs, when they have developed through the period of growth, may be relatively high. 
by methods at present known it is of course not possible to calculate the lowest existing iqs it is an interesting theoretical question as to how low iq can run in the human species and as to what quote, just not any intelligence end quote, or zero intelligence would be the tables and graphs which follow show the facts with respect to the comparative stupidity of the males and females in the samples here studied in making the graphs in figures five and six all individuals over sixteen years of age have been grouped together as adults because after that point the cases at any one age are so very few that comparison from year to year has practically no reliability it will be seen that at the points which include the great majority of cases namely among children of school age the females have less intelligence than the males after the age of sixteen years the difference disappears for cases presented for examination after that age the average i q is fifty two for both males and females among segregated cases the average i q for adult females is forty three and for adult males forty five with a large measure of unreliability it is interesting to see what the differences are between the presented and the finally segregated the i q s of those presented run about ten points higher on the average than the i q s of the actually committed the difference in stupidity between the sexes is much more marked among those actually segregated than among those presented for examination a girl must be relatively more stupid than a boy in order to be presented for examination in the first place and she must be still more stupid comparatively in order that she may be actually segregated as unfit for social and economic participation table three part one showing the relative stupidity of males and females presented for mental examination as suspected mental defectives omitting cases of mental age below three nineteen thirteen birthday age years seven to eight males average i q to the nearest one half of one per cent sixty nine absolute deviation seventeen point eight cases seventeen females average i q seventy five absolute deviation nine point three cases eleven birthday age eight to nine males average i q sixty five absolute deviation fourteen point five cases twenty one females average i q fifty eight absolute deviation fifteen point nine cases sixteen birthday age nine to ten males average i q seventy absolute deviation fifteen point four cases thirty females average i q seventy absolute deviation sixteen point two cases fourteen birthday age ten to eleven males average i q seventy one absolute deviation fourteen point eight cases forty one females average i q sixty seven absolute deviation twelve point six cases eighteen birthday age eleven to twelve males average i q seventy absolute deviation fourteen point three cases forty three females average i q sixty six absolute deviation twelve point five cases sixteen birthday age twelve to thirteen males average i q sixty six absolute deviation ten point two cases fifty two females average i q fifty seven absolute deviation twelve point six cases thirty eight birthday age thirteen to fourteen males average i q sixty seven absolute deviation eleven point three cases fifty two females average i q sixty seven absolute deviation eleven point zero cases twenty four birthday age fourteen to fifteen males average i q sixty one absolute deviation eleven point five cases fifty five females average i q sixty absolute deviation twelve point four cases twenty two age fifteen to sixteen males average i q fifty three absolute deviation nine point nine cases forty five females average i q fifty seven absolute deviation eight point zero cases thirty three age sixteen plus males average i q fifty two absolute deviation nine point four cases seventy 
Females, average IQ, 52. Absolute deviation, 10.3. Cases, 150. Table 3, Part 2. Showing the relative stupidity of males and females detained in an institution for mental defectives, omitting cases of mental age below three, except a few such cases examined by Kuhlman's method, 1921. Birthday age, years, 7 to 8. Males, average IQ, 60. Absolute deviation, 14.5. Cases, 14. Females, average IQ, 62. Absolute deviation, 18.3. Cases, 17. Age, 8 to 9. Males, average IQ, 53. Absolute deviation, 13.0. Cases, 21. Females, average IQ, 51. Absolute deviation, 9.2. Cases, 15. Age, 9 to 10. Males, average IQ, 64. Absolute deviation, 14.1. Cases, 30. Females, average IQ, 64. Absolute deviation, 10.7. Cases, 9. Age, 10 to 11. Males, average IQ, 61. Absolute deviation, 15.7. Cases, 34. Females, average IQ, 52. Absolute deviation, 13.6. Cases, 20. Age, 11 to 12. Males, average IQ, 60. Absolute deviation, 13.4. Cases, 26. Females, average IQ, 50. Absolute deviation, 11.2. Cases, 17. Age, 12 to 13. Males, average IQ, 61. Absolute deviation, 11.5. Cases, 29. Females, average IQ, 51. Absolute deviation, 14.3. Cases, 29. Age, 13 to 14. Males, average IQ, 60. Absolute deviation, 14.9. Cases, 37. Females, average IQ, 48. Absolute deviation, 14.9. Cases, 18. Age, 14 to 15. Males, average IQ, 56. Absolute deviation, 11.1. Cases, 39. Females, average IQ, 55. Absolute deviation, 10.6. Cases, 41. Age, 15 to 16. Males, average IQ, 55. Absolute deviation, 9.2. Cases, 41. Females, average IQ, 50. Absolute deviation, 13.6. Cases, 28. Age, 16 to 17. Males, average IQ, 47. Absolute deviation, 14.8. Cases, 20. Females, average IQ, 44. Absolute deviation, 8.7. Cases, 33. Age 17 to 18. Males, average IQ, 33. Absolute deviation, 10.9. Cases, 13. Females, average IQ, 51. Absolute deviation, 8.7. Cases, 24. Age 18 to 19. Males, average IQ, 44. Absolute deviation, 13.4. Cases, 18. Females, average IQ, 44. Absolute deviation, 7.5. Cases, 15. Age, 19 to 20. Males, average IQ, 53. Absolute deviation, 15.0. Cases, 9. Females, average IQ, 50. Absolute deviation, 14.3. Cases, 22. Age, 20 to 21. Males, average IQ, 38. Absolute deviation, 9.1. Cases, 6. Females, average IQ, 43. Absolute deviation, 8.8. .8. Cases, 15. Age, 21 to 22. Males, average IQ, 44. Absolute deviation, 10.9. Cases, 9. Females, average IQ, 47. Absolute deviation, 7.4. Cases, 12. Age, 22 to 23. Males, average IQ, 37. Absolute deviation, 11.4. Cases, 11. Females, average IQ, 41. Absolute deviation, 11.3. Cases, 5. Age, 23 to 24. Males, average IQ, 52. Absolute deviation, 13.4. Cases, 5. Females, average IQ, 55. Absolute deviation, 12.3. Cases, 8. Age, 24 to 25. 
males, average IQ, 47, absolute deviation, 9.3, cases, 6, females, average IQ, 45, absolute deviation, 8.3, cases, 12, age, 25 plus, males, average IQ, 41, absolute deviation, 1.2, cases, 64, females, average IQ, 43, absolute deviation, 9.7, Cases 103. Figure 5. Presenting graphically the facts of Table 3, Part 1, showing the comparative stupidity of males and females brought for mental examination, age for age. Figure 6. Presenting graphically the facts of Table 3, Part 2, showing the comparative stupidity of males and females segregated in an institution, age for age. Table 4 showing the distribution of persons measuring below three years in mental level from seven years through adult, both those presented, 1913, and those segregated, 1921. Birthday age, years, seven to eight. Examined, number of males, seven, number of females, five. Segregated, number of males, 13, number of females, five. Age, eight to nine. Examined, males, nine, females 2, segregated, males 9, females 8, age, 9 to 10, examined, males 1, females 4, segregated, males 5, females 6, age 10 to 11, examined, males 5, females 3, segregated, males 7, females 1, age, 11 to 12, examined, males 1, females 2, segregated, males 4, females 4, age 12 to 13, examined, males 0, females 0, segregated, males 5, females 8, age 13 to 14, examined, males 1, females 0, segregated, males 6, females 4, age 14 to 15, examined, males 2, females 0, segregated, males 4, females 2, age 15 to 16, examined, males 0, females 1, segregated, males 2, females 6, age 16 plus, examined, males 1, females 4, segregated, males 34, females 28. Table 5, Part 1. Showing the distribution of IQ among persons presented for mental examination as suspected mental defectives by sex omitting all cases under seven years of age, and all cases under three years of mental age, 1913. IQ, 15 to 25. Males, frequency, 8. Percent of total, 1.8. Females, frequency, 6. Percent of total, 1.7. IQ, 25 to 35. Males, frequency, 20. Percent of total, 4.6. Females, frequency, 21 percent of total 6.1. IQ 35 to 45. Males frequency 32, percent of total 7.5. Females frequency 33, percent of total 9.6. IQ 45 to 55. Males frequency 64, percent of total 15.0. Females frequency 71, percent of total 20.7. IQ 55 to 65, males frequency 99, percent of total 23.2, females frequency 81, percent of total 23.6. IQ 65 to 75, males frequency 103, percent of total 24.1, females frequency 80, percent of total 23.3. IQ 75 to 85, Males frequency 61, percent of total 14.3. Females frequency 36, percent of total 10.4. IQ 85 to 95. Males frequency 29, percent of total 6.8. Females frequency 13, percent of total 3.7. IQ 95 to 105. Males frequency 10, percent of total 2.3. Females frequency 2, percent of total 0 0.5. Table 5, Part 2. 
showing the distribution of IQ among inmates of an institution for mental defectives by sex, omitting cases under seven years of age, and cases under three years of mental age, except those measured by Kuhlman's method, 1921. IQ, 15 to 25. Males frequency 29, percent of total 6.7. Females frequency 24, percent of total 5.4. IQ, 25 to 35. Males frequency 47, percent of total 10.9. Females frequency 49, percent of total 11.0. IQ, 35 to 45. Males frequency 66, percent of total 15.2 females frequency 117, percent of total 26.4. IQ, 45 to 55. Males frequency 90, percent of total 20.8. Females frequency 107, percent of total 24.1. IQ, 55 to 65. Males frequency 83, percent of total 19.2. Females frequency 81, percent of total 18.2. IQ 65 to 75. Males frequency 72, percent of total 16.6. .6. Female frequency 41, percent of total 9.2. IQ 75 to 85. Males frequency 27, percent of total 6.2. Female frequency 17, percent of total 3.8. IQ 85 to 95. Male frequency 9, percent of total 2.0. Female frequency 5, percent of total 1.1. IQ 95 to 105. Male frequency 9, percent of total 2.0. Female frequency 2, percent of total 0 0.4. Figure 7, presenting graphically the facts of Table 5, Part 1 showing the comparative distribution of IQ for males and females brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives. Figure 8, presenting graphically the facts of Table 5, Part 2, showing the comparative distribution of IQ for males and females segregated in an institution for mental defectives. 7. Speculative Interpretations the data here collected show that the pressures which bring about segregation of feeble-minded school children are differential in their action upon the sexes, but they do not tell us what the pressures are. So far as the present study is concerned, interpretation of the nature of these pressures remains in the state of conjecture. Girls segregated as mentally deficient were more stupid than boys segregated as mentally deficient. Fewer girls than boys are segregated and the girls who are segregated escape longer than do the boys. These phenomena may possibly arise because, one, parents are more interested in their daughters than in their sons, and are more reluctant to part from them. Two, parents and other relatives are more interested in boys than in girls, and counsel is, therefore, more readily sought for deviating boys than for deviating girls. Three, Girls and women have legal and customary means of economic survival, which boys and men do not have, and which require a low minimum of intelligence. 4. Intelligence is not so important an element in the social economic survival of girls and women as it is in that of boys and men, so that girls who are extremely stupid do not give concern and are not noticed to the same extent as are boys of the same degree of actual stupidity. 5. Boys, because they are less restricted, come more often into conflict with the law than do girls, and are thus scrutinized and referred more often by courts. 6. The subjective notion as to what constitutes intelligent behavior is different in the case of girls from what it is in the case of boys. 7. Factors not included in any of these conjectures may be operative. Data showing the social economic status of the feeble-minded over 16 years of age among the cases presented for mental examination are given herewith. They are suggestive as to a line of research which might prove fruitful in an attempt to determine what are the forces the differential action of which has been demonstrated. Vocational status of persons over 16 years of age presented as suspected mental defectives, 1913. Vocation. Housework at home. 
males one, females twenty-eight. Housework for wage, average four dollars per month and board, males zero, females nineteen. Married. Footnote. Marriage is listed as a vocation, since these women all did housework, and were in turn supported. And footnote. Males zero, females sixteen. Prostitute. Males zero, females fifteen. Still at school. Males zero, females five. Nursery maid. Males zero, females three. Engaged to be married. Males zero, females two. Common law marriage. Males zero, females two. Factory hand. Unspecified. Males zero, females two. Transfer from an institution. Males five, females two. Scrubbing in hospitals. Males zero, females two. Feather worker. Males zero, females one. Cabaret singer. Males zero, females one. Bottle filler. Males zero, females one. Paper worker. Males zero, females one. Book binder. Males zero, females one. Laundry hand. Males one, females one. Soldering lamps. Males zero, females one. Chambermaid. Males zero, females one. Cigar maker. Males zero, females one. Manicurist. Males zero, females one. Errand boy. Males three, females zero. Porter. Males one, females zero. Candy worker. Males one, females zero. Delivery boy. Males one, females zero. Gardener. Males one, females zero. Rag picker. Males one, females zero. Plumber's helper. Males one, females zero. Janitor. Males one, females zero. Umbrella mender. Males one, females zero. Helps father. Males one, females zero. Music student. Males one, females zero. Newsboy. Males one, females zero. The above tabulation shows that there is certainly a sex difference in the occupations followed by the feeble-minded. Housework is the basis of survival for a very large percentage of feeble-minded women. This may be for relatives, as paid domestics, as married women, or as common-law wives. On the other hand, housework accounts for the survival of but one boy over sixteen years of age. Prostitution appears to offer the next most favorable basis for economic survival, among the feeble-minded girls here found. There seem to be no occupations which support feeble-minded men as well as housework and prostitution support feeble-minded women. Data showing the social economic status of feeble-minded women have been gathered and presented elsewhere. Footnote. Schlopp, M. C., and Hollingworth, L. S., An Economic and Social Study of Feeble-Minded Women, Medical Record, 1915. End footnote and are in harmony with the tabulation here made. It is a matter of common knowledge that girls, as a group, are not expected continuously to follow competitive careers for a living. It is expected that their work will be in the household, domestic work and child-rearing, performed by the majority non-competitively, as wives or daughters, and without a stipulated wage. Men, on the other hand, form a competitive group, working in rivalry with each other for a wage. This is true of even the simplest work that men do, such as digging with a pick, or loading sand on carriers. It would be expected a priori that the boy who cannot compete would become an object of concern. The girl who cannot compete mentally need not become an object of concern to the same extent, because she may drop into the non-competitive vocational life of the household, where she naturally performs many routine tasks, requiring but rudimentary intelligence, such as peeling vegetables, washing dishes, scrubbing, carrying fuel, and so forth. If physically unobjectionable, as may be the case, she may marry, thus fastening herself to economic support in a customary fashion. Or she may become a prostitute, for survival is possible in that pursuit at a low intellectual level. Thus feeble-minded girls fit in with the existing folkways in a relatively inconspicuous fashion. It should be worth while, from the standpoint of school and society, to determine just what the forces are which act to bring about differential segregation, 
and what the relative weight of each force is. A question of incidental interest arising from the graphs in figures 1 and 2 concerns the infrequency of individuals over 30 years of age. Why are there so few old people in the samples studied? Of those who are inmates at 12, at 13, or at 14 years of age, but few are left two decades later. Whether they die or find adjustment elsewhere by that age, our present study does not inform us. It may be that most of the persons as low-grade mentally as those here studied have perished by the age of forty years. Another question of interest, not answerable from the data at hand, arises from figures five and six. Why should the IQs become lower as the birthday age of the individuals studied increases so that adults have the lowest average IQ of all? It may be that the higher IQs among the children win discharge from the institution by the age of maturity. This would not, however, explain the same phenomenon in the 1913 data. The slight and gradual decrease in IQ among the very stupid during the course of development may enter as a factor. Footnote. Kuhlman, F., The Results of Repeated Mental Examinations of 639 Feeble-Minded Over a Period of Ten Years, Journal of Applied Psychology, 1921. End footnote. By intensive study of complete histories, these questions could doubtless be answered. 8. Conclusions. From the foregoing study, the following conclusions are drawn. 1. More males than females are brought in New York City for mental examination as suspected mental defectives. 2. More males than females are committed to the Municipal Institution for Mental Defectives in New York City. 3. Males and females brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives and those so committed in New York City are not equally distributed with respect to birthday age. From zero years to sixteen years of age, there is a decided preponderance of males. From the age of sixteen years, the reverse is true. The frequency of cases after sixteen years is greatly reduced, and almost no cases past the age of forty are involved. 4. Males and females brought for mental examination as suspected mental defectives, and those so committed, are not equally old mental age for mental age. At all degrees of stupidity, females survive longer without examination or commitment than do males of the same mental status. 5. Males and females suspected of being mentally defective, and those segregated as such, are not equally stupid age for age. The females are of lower grade than the males, up to the age of about 16 years. Among the adults here studied, the segregated males have an average IQ of 42.6, and the females have an average IQ of 45.0, while among the adults presented for examination, both males and females have an average IQ of 52. Since the great majority of all cases falls under 16 years, the central tendency of IQ is lower for males than for females. 6. Institutional statistics, showing merely the numerical ratio of the sexes to each other among inmates, are invalid as an index of sex differences in frequency and amount of mental deviation for the population at large. Such institutional statistics serve merely as an index of the extent to which it is comparatively easy and convenient for females who are extremely unintelligent to survive in the performance of their functions in ordinary society. 9. Implications The implications of this study are of interest for school and society. Among public school children, there are probably more feeble-minded girls than boys, since the girls corresponding to the higher-grade boys under institutional supervision are evidently left in the population at large. Yet the registers of special classes for mentally deficient children show more boys than girls in such classes. Feeble-minded girls will doubtless continue to drift with the regular classes, unless selection for special classes is made in a rigidly objective manner. From the standpoint of society, it is of interest to know that feeble-minded girls fit into the existing social and economic order more conveniently than do boys of the same mental quality. Extremely stupid girls thus survive, and presumably reproduce their kind, more easily than do extremely stupid boys. The social order is such that survival for the former 
depends less upon intelligence than it does for the latter. In so far as the preponderance of males among segregated feeble-minded persons has been thought to support the theory of greater male variability in intellect, it must be said that a mere census of such persons is without validity as evidence. 10. Acknowledgments. Acknowledgments should be made of the courtesy and cooperation of Dr. M. G. Schlapp, Director of the Clearing House for Mental Defectives, the Postgraduate Hospital, New York City, of Dr. John S. Richards, Medical Superintendent, the Children's Hospital, Randalls Island, New York City, and of Dr. Louise E. Poole, Psychologist, the Children's Hospital, Randalls Island, New York City. They facilitated in every way the collection of data on which the study is based. Table 1, Part 1, Table 2, Part 1, and Figure 1 are here reproduced by courtesy of William Wood and Company, publishers of the medical record. End of Differential Action Upon the Sexes of Forces Which Tend to Segregate the Feeble-Minded Read by Tricia G. A Laboratory Study of Fear The Case of Peter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Coutonge A Laboratory Study of Fear The Case of Peter by Mary Cover Jones First published in Pedagogical Seminary 31, 308-315 as part of a genetic study of emotions, footnote, the research was conducted with the advice of Dr. John B. Watson by means of a subvention granted by the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial to the Institute of Educational Research of Teachers College. End footnote. A number of children were observed in order to determine the most effective method of removing fear responses. The case of Peter illustrates how a fear may be removed under laboratory conditions. His case was selected from a number of others for the following reasons. 1. Progress in combating the fear reactions was so marked that many of the details of the process could be observed easily. 2. It was possible to continue the study over a period of more than three months. 3. The notes of a running diary show the characteristics of a healthy, normal, interesting child, well adjusted except for his exaggerated fear reactions. A few descriptive notes show something of his personality. Remarkably active, easily interested, capable of prolonged endeavour. A favourite with the children as well as with the nurses and matrons. Peter has a healthy passion for possessions. Everything that he lays his hands on is his. As this is frequently disputed by some other child, there are occasionally violent scenes of protest. These disturbances are not more frequent than might be expected in a three-year-old, in view of the fact that he is continually forced to adjust to a large group of children, nor are they more marked in Peter's case than in others of his age. Peter's IQ at the age of two years and ten months was 102 on the Coleman revision of the Binet. At the same time, he passed five of the three-year tests on the Stanford revision. In initiative and constructive ability, however, he is superior to his companions of the same mental age. 4. The case is a sequel to one recently contributed by Dr. Watson and furnished supplementary material of interest in a genetic study of emotions. Dr. Watson's case illustrated how a fear could be produced experimentally under laboratory conditions. Footnote. Watson, J.B. and R.R. Studies in Infant Psychology, Scientific Monthly, December 1921. End footnote. A brief review follows. Albert, 11 months of age, was an infant with a phlegmatic disposition, afraid of nothing under the sun except a loud sound made by striking a steel bar. This made him cry. By striking the bar at the same time that Albert touched a white rat, the fear was transferred to the white rat. After seven combined stimulations, rat and sound, Albert not only became greatly disturbed at the sight of the rat, but his fear had spread to include a white rabbit cotton wool, a fur coat, and the experimenter's hair. It did not transfer to his wooden blocks and other objects very dissimilar to the rat. In referring to this case, Dr. Watson says, 
We have shown experimentally that when you condition a child to show fear of an animal, this fear transfers or spreads in such a way that without separate conditioning, he becomes afraid of many animals. If you take any one of these objects producing fear and uncondition, will fear of the other objects in the series disappear at the same time? That is, will the unconditioning spread without further training to other stimuli? Dr. Watson intended to continue the study of Albert in an attempt to answer this question, but Albert was removed from the hospital and the series of observations was discontinued. About three years later, this case, which seemed almost to be Albert grown a bit older, was discovered in our laboratory. Peter was two years and ten months old when we began to study him. He was afraid of a white rat, and this fear extended to a rabbit, a fur coat, a feather, cotton wool, etc., but not to wooden blocks and similar toys. An abridgment of the first laboratory notes on Peter read as follows. Peter was put in a crib in a playroom and immediately became absorbed in his toys. A white rat was introduced into the crib from behind. The experimenter was behind a screen. At sight of the rat, Peter screamed and fell flat on his back in a paroxysm of fear. The stimulus was removed and Peter was taken out of the crib and put into a chair. Barbara was brought to the crib and the white rat introduced as before. She exhibited no fear but picked the rat up in her hand. Peter sat quietly watching Barbara and the rat. A string of beads belonging to Peter had been left in the crib. Whenever the rat touched a part of the string, he would say, My beads, in a complaining voice, although he made no objections when Barbara touched them. Invited to get down from the chair, he shook his head, fear not yet subsided. Twenty-five minutes elapsed before he was ready to play about freely. The next day, his reactions to the following situations and objects were noted. Playroom and crib. Selected toys. Got into crib without protest. White ball rolled in. Picked it up and held it. Fur rug hung over crib. Cried until it was removed. Fur coat hung over crib. Cried until it was removed. Cotton. Whimpered, withdrew, cried. Hat with feathers. Cried. Blue woolly sweater. Looked, turned away, no fear. White toy rabbit of rough cloth. No interest, no fear. Wooden doll. No interest, no fear. This case made it possible for the experiment to continue where Dr. Watson had left off. The first problem was that of unconditioning a fear response to an animal, and the second, that of determining whether unconditioning to one stimulus spreads without further training to other stimuli. From the test situations which were used to reveal fears, it was found that Peter showed even more marked fear responses to the rabbit than to the rat. It was decided to use the rabbit for unconditioning and to proceed as follows. Each day Peter and three other children were brought to the laboratory for a play period. The other children were selected carefully because of their entirely fearless attitude towards the rabbit and because of their satisfactory adjustments in general. The rabbit was always present during a part of the play period. From time to time, Peter was brought in alone so that his reactions could be observed and progress noted. From reading over the notes for each session, it was apparent that there had been improvements by more or less regular steps from almost complete terror at sight of the rabbit to a completely positive response with no signs of disturbance. New situations requiring closer contact with the rabbit had been gradually introduced, and the degree to which these situations were avoided, tolerated or welcomed at each experimental session gave the measure of improvement. Analysis of the notes on Peter's reactions indicated the following progressive steps in his degree of toleration. A. Rabbit anywhere in the room in a cage causes fear reactions. B. Rabbit 12 feet away in cage tolerated. C. Rabbit 4 feet away in cage tolerated. D. Rabbit 3 feet away in cage tolerated. E. Rabbit close in cage tolerated. F. Rabbit free in room tolerated. G. Rabbit touched when experimenter holds it. H. Rabbit touched when free in room. I. Rabbit defied by spitting at it, throwing things at it, imitating it. J. Rabbit allowed on tray of high chair. K. Squats in defenseless position beside rabbit. L. Helps experimenter to carry rabbit to its cage. M. Holds rabbit on lap. N. Stays alone in room with rabbit. 
O. Allows rabbit in playpen with him. P. Fondles rabbit affectionately. Q. Let's rabbit nibble his fingers. These degrees of toleration merely represented the stages in which improvement occurred. They did not give any indication of the intervals between steps, nor of the plateaus, relapses, and sudden gains which were actually evident. To show these features, a curve was drawn by using the 17 steps given above as the y-axis of a chart, and the experimental sessions as the x-axis. The units are not equal on either axis, as the degrees of toleration have merely been set down as they appeared from consideration of the laboratory notes, with no attempt to evaluate the steps. Likewise, the experimental sessions were not equidistant in time. Peter was seen twice daily for a period, and thence only once a day. At one point, illness and quarantine interrupted the experiments for two months. There is no indication of these irregularities on the chart. For example, Along the x-axis, 1 represents the date December 4th when the observation began. 11 and 12 represent the dates March 10 a.m. and p.m. From December 17th to March 7th, Peter was not available for study. The question arose as to whether or not the points on the y-axis, which indicated progress to the experimenter, represented real advance and not merely idiosyncratic reactions of the subject. The tolerance series, as indicated by the experimenter, was presented in random order to six graduate students and instructors in psychology to be arranged so as to indicate increase in tolerance in their judgment. An average correlation of 0 0.70 with the experimenter's arrangement was found for the six ratings. This indicates that the experimenter was justified from an a priori point of view in designating the steps to be progressive stages. The first seven periods show how Peter progressed from a great fear of the rabbit to a tranquil indifference and even a voluntary pat on the rabbit's back when others were set in the example. The notes for the seventh period, see A on chart, read, Laurel, Mary, Arthur, Peter, playing together in the laboratory. Experimenter put rabbit down on floor. Arthur said, Peter doesn't cry when he sees the rabbit come out. Peter, no. He was a little concerned as to whether or not the rabbit would eat his kitty car. Laurel and Mary stroked the rabbit and chatted away excitedly. Peter walked over, touched the rabbit on the back, exulting, I touched him on the end. At this period, Peter was taken to the hospital with scarlet fever. He did not return for two months. By referring to the chart at B, it will be noted that this line shows a decided drop to the early level of fear reaction when he returned. This was easily explained by the nurse who brought Peter from the hospital. As they were entering a taxi at the door of the hospital, a large dog, running past, jumped at them. Both Peter and the nurse were very much frightened. Peter so much that he lay in the taxi pale and quiet, and the nurse debated whether or not to return him to the hospital. This seemed reason enough for his precipitate descent back to the original fear level. Being threatened by a large dog when ill, and in a strange place, and being with an adult who also showed fear, was a terrifying situation against which our training could not have fortified him. At this point, B, we began another method of treatment, that of direct conditioning. Peter was seated in a high chair and given food which he liked. The experimenter brought the rabbit in a wire cage as close as she could without arousing a response which would interfere with his eating. Through the presence of the pleasant stimulus, food, whenever the rabbit was shown, the fear was eliminated gradually in favour of a positive response. Occasionally also, other children were brought in to help with the unconditioning. These facts are of interest in following the charted progress. The first decided rise at sea was due to the presence of another child who influenced Peter's reaction. The notes for this day read, Lawrence and Peter sitting near together in their high chairs eating candy. Rabbit in cage put down 12 feet away. Peter began to cry. Lawrence said, Oh, rabbit! Clambered down, ran over and looked in the cage at him. Peter followed close and watched. The next two decided rises at D&E occurred on a day when a student assistant, Dr. S, was present. Peter was very fond of Dr. S, whom he insisted was his papa. Although Dr. S did not directly influence Peter by any overt suggestions, it may be that having him there contributed to Peter's general feeling of well-being, and thus indirectly affected his reactions. The fourth rise on the chart at F was, like the first, due to the influence of another child. Notes for the 21st session read, Peter with candy and high chair. 
Experimenter brought Rabbit and sat down in front of the tray with it. Peter cried out, I don't want him, and withdrew. Rabbit was given to another child sitting near to hold. His holding the rabbit served as a powerful suggestion. Peter wanted the rabbit on his lap and held it for an instant. The decided drop at G was caused by a slight scratch when Peter was helping to carry the rabbit to his cage. The rapid ascent following shows how quickly he regained lost ground. In one of our last sessions, Peter showed no fear, although another child was present who also showed marked disturbance at sight of the rabbit. An attempt was made from time to time to see what verbal organization accompanied this process of unconditioning. Upon Peter's return from the hospital, the following conversation took place. Experimenter. What do you do upstairs, Peter? The laboratory was upstairs. Peter. I see my brother. Take me up to see my brother. Experimenter. What else will you see? Peter. Blocks. Peter's reference to blocks indicated a definite memory as he played with blocks only in the laboratory. No further response of any significance could be elicited. In the laboratory, two days later, he had seen the rabbit once in the meantime, he said suddenly, Beads can't bite me. Beads can only look at me. Towards the end of the training, an occasional, I like the rabbit, was all the language he had to parallel the changed emotional organization. Early in the experiment, an attempt was made to get some measure of the visceral changes accompanying Peter's fear reactions. On one occasion, Dr. S determined Peter's blood pressure outside the laboratory, and again later in the laboratory, while he was in a state of much anxiety caused by the rabbits being held close to him by the experimenter. The diastolic blood pressure changed from 65 to 80 on this occasion. Peter was taken to the infirmary the next day for the routine physical examination and developed there a suspicion of medical instruments, which made it inadvisable to proceed with this phase of the work. Peter has gone home to a difficult environment, but the experimenter is still in touch with him. He showed in the last interview, as on the later portions of the chart, a genuine fondness for the rabbit. What has happened to the fear of the other objects? The fear of the cotton, the fur coat, feathers, was entirely absent at our last interview. He looked at them, handled them, and immediately turned to something which interested him more. The reaction to the rats and the fur rug with the stuffed head was greatly modified and improved. While he did not show the fondness for these that was apparent with the rabbit, he made a fair adjustment. For example, Peter would pick up the tin box containing frogs or rats and carry it around the room. When requested, he picked up the fur rug and carried it to the experimenter. What would Peter do if confronted by a strange animal? At the last interview, the experimenter presented a mouse and a tangled mass of angleworms. At first sight, Peter showed slight distress reactions and moved away, but before the period was over, he was carrying the worms around and watching the mouse with undisturbed interest. By unconditioning Peter to the rabbit, he has apparently been helped to overcome many superfluous fears, some completely, some to a less degree. His tolerance of strange animals and unfamiliar situations has apparently increased. The study is still incomplete. Peter's fear of the animals which were shown him was probably not a directly conditioned fear. It is unlikely that he had ever had any experience with white rats, for example. Where the fear originated, and with what stimulus is not known, nor is it known what Peter would do if he were again confronted with the original fear situation. All of the fears which were unconditioned were transferred fears, and it has not yet been learned whether or not the primary fear can be eliminated by training the transfers. Another matter which must be left to speculation is the future welfare of the subject. His home consists of one furnished room, which is occupied by his mother and father, a brother of nine years, and himself. Since the death of an older sister, he is the recipient of most of the unwise affection of his parents. His brother appears to bear him a grudge because of this favoritism, as might be expected. Peter hears continually, Ben is so bad and so dumb, but Peter is so good and so smart. His mother is a highly emotional individual who cannot get through an interview, however brief, without a display of tears. She is totally incapable of providing a home on the $25 a week which her husband steadily earns. In an attempt to control Peter, she resorts to frequent fear suggestions. Come in, Peter. Someone wants to steal you. To her erratic resorts to discipline, Peter reacts with temper tantrums. He was denied a summer in the country because his father forgets he's tired when he has Peter around. Surely a discouraging outlook for Peter. But the recent development of psychological studies of young children and the growing tendency to carry the knowledge gained in the psychological laboratories into the home and school 
induce us to predict a more wholesome treatment of a future generation of Peters. Teachers College, Columbia University. Accepted for publication by John B. Watson. End of A Laboratory Study of Fear. The Case of Peter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kosmarski. Has Psychology Failed? by Joseph Jastrow. William James, most honored of psychologists, records the note of failure inscribing his own great text, since became a classic, as a loathsome, distended, putrefied, tropical mass testifying to nothing but two facts first that there is no such thing as a science of psychology and second that w j is an incapable he carried on his psychological genius to the more congenial dimes of philosophy g stanley hall psychologist for a lifetime confessed his growing dissatisfaction with results and a growing uncertainty as to whether we are really on the right trails he sets forth that the condition of psychology is far from satisfactory, and that the promise of two decades ago has not been fulfilled. 1923. Both these pioneers in American psychology I knew, and I knew from them the sources of their discontent. If I may presume to render a verdict in 1935, admitting my own percavi, it would be one of agreement, confirmed by the nearer outlook. James had in mind, and Hall, partly so, the mode of emergence of modern psychology as made in Germany. Hall's encyclopedic spread subordinated his early addition to Teutonic Midnight Oil. James ever found that lamp of learning stuffy, yet indispensable. He called Münsterberg to be his laboratory viker. The present generation has been a waning interest in origins of a half century ago. They know that the psychological laboratory was first established at Leipzig by v William Wundt, where the innovation aroused suspicion among the Gellerhert, skeptical as to whether the soul had really been captured and placed on the dissecting table. Also, it attracted the freer venturing minds of a small but influential following from beyond the seas. A new career in psychology, patterned after the manner of the exact sciences, was heralded in Hall's first book, aspects of german page 262 culture an ominous title today some decades before their halt had been an attempt to reduce psychology to measurement it began with so lowly a performance as judging by lifting which of a pair of weights was the heavier and plotting endless series of just observable differences it culminated in the psychophysics of feschner a strange fusion of a mystic and an exactist described by james as the patient whimsies of a dear old man to whom belongs the imperishable glory of setting psychology on the wrong tack Wundt's experimental explorations of the mental structure grew to comprehensive proportions they placed psychology on the academic map they inspired hall's pioneer efforts at johns hopkins leading to doctorates in psychology of which i happened to be the first recipient the most complete parallel of leipzig in america was established cosmopolitanly at a new world ithaca by a british titianer who in oxford gown and manner inducted yankee disciples into teutonic methods up to the end, in 1927, he resisted the tidal wave of innovation all along the psychological front, particularly the swarming hosts of applied psychology, resolved that the academic robe of pure psychology should not be defiled by the overalls of practice. To him, psychology was a fach, a pedigree, Wissenschaft. What to Tischner was the glory of psychology was to James and Hall, and to each differently the warrant of its failure they looked beyond horizons as we do to-day ever more hospitably more world consciously experiment continues to be the major occupation of psychologists by that route psychology became an accredited science 
to attempt a balance sheet and consider how far the psychological plants are paying dividends is too large a venture for the present purpose despite the rapprochement of worldly reference and scientific pursuit the psychologist's laboratory is still too much a bowling alley where artificial pins are set up in formal patterns and tumbled down and scored the strikes made have only a distant relation to the setup in the rest of the world what is measurable is not by that circumstance made more significant we measure what we can not what we would and reach the measurement by way of assumptions that weaken coerce or distort the very relationships we would appraise the essential measure of rationality may escape the ingenuity that devises the tests the worship of the golden foot rule is a modern form of idolatry the assurance of many an experimentalist is conditioned upon an insensitiveness to psychological values there is no inherent validity in numbers no sanctity in equations they may embody important and valid truths or trivial inconsequences or pretentious errors laboratory artifacts are imperfect substitutes for complete human situations until psychology becomes more critical of its line of march james's skepticism and hall's disappointment will hold and my sympathetic repetition of their lament remain pertinent the early misdirection of psychology was the failure to follow wholeheartedly the biological lead from the beginning to the end of the chapter the concept of evolution was at hand its power to fertilize the psychic pastures feebly appreciated a sense of it appears in the eclectic contributions of francis galton who was a keen neuropsychologist for not being one professionally in them is foreshadowed the true consummation the psychologist is to become the naturalist of the mind the banner under which the representative majority of present-day psychologists are actually enrolled though they do not say so and may not know it i have labeled naturalistic psychology its scope has expanded far beyond the vistas of twenty years ago the necessity of a name i deplore for there is but one psychology as there is one physics one physiology i am merely designating a basic position it is not god save the mark another schism another proprietary solution it indicates a trend dominant for decades productive of sober and significant contributions the conflict of the psychologies in learned arenas and in popular forums is a further dismal evidence of its crucial failure exposed to persuasive appeals that this or that system alone is the gospel truth and none genuine without a personal signature the layman is justifiably irritated into exclaiming a plague on all your schools two claimants to the psychological dominion are peculiarly belligerent behaviorism and psychoanalysis behaviorism mcdougall calls a bastard project i view its parentage more charitably it represents a legitimate protest against the anti-naturalism of the orthodox psychology which was so long in the saddle more precisely against the neglect of the naturalistic axiom that the human organism mind and all from guts to cortex and all its expressions from sigh to soliloquy is root stem and blossom an instrument of behavior in any meaningful sense substantially all american psychologists were behaviorists long before nineteen twelve which watson makes the year of annunciation of the dispensation renunciation of the heir of previous ways and denunciation of the rest of his brethren unfortunately the knight of behaviorism has set his lance at an untenanted windmill the fallacy of the behaviorists formula lies in the omitted terms with the result that were he consistent his cupboard would be as bare as mother hubbard's he smuggles in his provender from stores which he ignores he naively sets forth that under the stimulus of a falling apple a horse in the pasture responds by munching it under the same stimulus a newton responds by evolving the law of gravitation the difference is said to be explained by the different habit systems of physicist and horse or by recalling that they were differently conditioned by their respective parents even that illustration is unduly complimentary 
to the explanatory value of the behaviorist's barren formula of stimulus and response. It is nearer to his level of solution to select as a parallel the philanthropic machine attached to the pillars and the subway, which to the stimulus of a copper scent responds with a block of chocolate or if stimulated in another event to its reflexes responds with a stick of chewing gum ignoring the while the part played in the result by both mr wrigley and the designer of the machine under this simple and lucid but somewhat adolescent dispensation there is no more need for psychology than the theology that discovered in the apple the fall of man the folly of behaviorism fairly obvious in its premises becomes glaring in its conclusion which requires of its believers the courage to deny large areas of compelling fact heredity is nullified insanity is made an illusion of the examining psychiatrist imagery inconsistently becomes imaginary and consciousness a phobia avoided by defensive circumlocutions there was one consoling fact imported from russia and sadly overworked on its arrival this was the conditioned reflex of a front-paged dog whose saliva started rivers of ink and floods of uncritical theories conditioning became the universal solvent the behavioristic redemption of mankind was at hand so far as concerns the major reaches of human behavior the actual and important truth is that the big brain our chief glory and no less the source of our direct woes is in an intricate mechanism for delivering us from the slavery of conditioning the cerebral cortex is a proclamation of emancipation still however conditioned by the ancient bondage contemporary with the earthquake of behaviorism came the air raid of freudianism strangely enough in one point of attack the nursery they agreed the infant was doomed by maternal conditioning in the one version by a resurrected epidus incest in the other no theological damnation of the innocence carried so awful a charge as infant sexuality polymorphous pervert hurled and indiscriminately at all babes their later characters were destined to be molded not by the influences of the schoolroom or the amenities of the drawing-room but by the intimate ceremonies customarily confined to the bathroom parents became bewildered by the antics of psychologists popularized by news value standards the public forgot that the great body of safe and sane psychologists were quite otherwise minded and otherwise employed i have touched upon only some of the circumstances responsible for the chaotic appearance presented by psychology and the rationale of its failure to lead a respect scientific life most remote from my intention is it to belittle freud i regard him as a mastermind whose originality of insight has brought into the psychological picture an important illumination i regret that the deficiencies in his logic his ignorings his flagrant misinterpretations of the precepts of a naturalistic psychology have led him into woeful extravagance in application this invited the disaster which his followers completed. The heroic values of Freud's psychology lie in the adequate recognition of the emotional life, the play of subconscious functioning, including fantasy, the great extent of psychogenic influence, all directed to the abnormal mind, and by that illumination reinforcing the understanding of our normal being the supplementing of the laboratory by the clinic developed a truer perspective of wherein we highly psychological creatures have our being but the homo freudians is not an authentic rendering of the psyche of human nature to complement psychology and investigate unexplored areas is one thing to ignore the rest of the psychic world and the labors of others is quite another and the dialects of young and adler increase the babel of tongues.
the freudian dispensation has indeed reconstructed the visage of homo and correctly in so far as it reinstates homo sentiens as primary to and conditioning homo sapiens it is the manner of the restoration with its capricious license of theory and extravagance of practice that raises its error and menace far above its truth and benefits intellectual ventures may lead to as strange issues as geographical ones the more complete analysis of historical patients in a then obscure viennese clinic has changed the mental habits of an emancipated generation neither psychology nor civilization will ever return to a pre-freudian stage freud has ignored the academic psychologists and they have returned the compliment they find his premises so unsupported by any naturalistic foundations his conclusions so vitiated by false logic that most of them reject his structure completely the more tolerant ponder and select and the essential values of psychoanalysis will remain the neo-freudians in england and a small group of critical freudians in germany have begun the salvaging but though professional freudians may disappear the valid deposit of their doctrines will be absorbed into the accredited body of psychology a retrospect of a quarter century touches a pivotal period in nineteen o nine freud and young came to this country at stanley hall's invitation in those days a bold step for hall to take this was the first academic recognition of psychoanalysis the same year is memorable for the transfer of binet and simon's mental test to american soil their establishment gave the decisive impetus to the emergence of an applied psychology congenial to the pragmatic temper of our pursuits the era of tests is highly characteristic of the psychological scene as an instrument of social industrial and educational diagnosis they have been vastly extended side by side with able leadership and significant accomplishments this open sesame to research has led to the uncritical acceptance of the i q as though it were engraved on the brain structure and binet had deciphered it its use by many workers in this wide open field gives the impression that intelligence has been discovered to be the capacity to pass intelligence tests its true nature as well as available indices remain to be determined the i q is a useful wedge and no more it is only by having the limitations of the tests constantly in mind that they can be validly applied the immense vogue of applied psychology has added to the difficulty of a sound program if judged by the volume of output the tail appears to wag the dog if judged by the industry of many of its protagonists the intention is to reconstruct the creature in the image of its caudal appendage when elaborate observations are arranged and calculations employed to determine how fish and orange marmalade shall be consumed in type to express the atmosphere of the commodity one wonders whether bringing psychology to earth has been altogether a blessing the slums of psychological racketeering exploit the same demands for simple solutions practical recipes and panaceas no country is so overridden with false prophets of pseudo-psychology and shortcut uplift roads to learning as the land of the bigger and better the responsible custodians of psychology are not blameless devising a system seems to be the surest way to make a noise that shall be heard the sooner systems and schools are relegated to the past the more promising the future when the unity of psychology shall be accepted as a preamble to its declaration of independence and its enrollment among the league of the sciences if called upon to indicate the approach and temper of naturalistic psychology which unites the wandering tribes and points the way to the promised land i cannot here outline a program i can only set down its major tenets it proceeds upon the conviction that psychology is all one unitary story that of the life of the mind viewed as a naturalist would view it the story appears in two versions the one of the evolution of behavior the other of the evolution of the nervous system its counterpart life consists of feeling and thinking and the fusion of two the order importance and treatments of topics are thereby determined origins mechanisms service these constitute the story of mind 
everything relevant finds a place in that composition. The present textbook chaos is the work of drifting pilots. They leave the student with the impression of a patchwork quilt, whereas actually the mind is a tapestry. The recent advance in the investigation of mind rivals in dramatic moment and exceeds in consequence the physicist's reconception of the vast cosmos and the chemist's revelation of the infinitesimal but potent atom. The student, and more consequentially, the educated man of affairs on whose vision the fate of the future will more and more responsibly fall, loses a vitalizing contact with psychology because its academic representatives have placed an obstructing screen of abstraction and technical ritual between the inquiring mind and the reality. More than a dislocated shoulder or fallen arches is wrong with psychology and answerable for much of its failure. The entire framework created in this studio is out of joint, presenting a mannequin in place of a man. Gestalt psychology is as good an example as any, in itself a valid correction. A good orthopedic job, it launches itself with a panaceal flourish and adds to the confusion of tongues. Yet my faith in the redemption of psychology remains, for it has within itself, once the shouting and the tumult die, a valid principle of interpretation. It happens to be the interpretation of the most critical force in the universe. The human mind will either elevate or exterminate the race. Any pronouncement that psychology has failed contrasts what might have been with what is because in the nearer perspective circumstance looms large i have chosen as awful examples to strangely disturbing interludes both in a measure extreme swings of the pendulum away from a too academic conception and toward mind as a living reality psychology has made in germany and psychology as made in america have much to answer for the American temper comes to the fore in the huge overgrowth of applied psychology, passing by stages of Avernian descent from conclusions weakly based in principle to assertions definitely unprincipled. Taking the name of psychology in vain has become a national habit, and the vanity of much that comes out of the mills in which our grounds out doctor's dissertations neither slowly nor exceeding fine is comic in its tragic air of consequence and its actual misdirection the flounderings of psychology and the bickerings of psychologists damage its prestige it is not only behaviorists who fail to see forest and trees in proper relation not only freudians who run a temperature no sooner was the meaning of glands for the mental life demonstrated than a glandular psychology reached the conclusion that harding gave us an adrenal administration and wilson a pituitary one the call is clear and loud for leaders of a broader gauge to redeem psychology and give its rightful place as a guide to human understanding there are consoling reflections a science that can endure the ravages of two such distempers as behaviorism and psychoanalysis and recover without permanent disfigurement must have a lusty constitution still more when i dwell upon the rich heritage of supremely significant knowledge which is all entitled to be called psychology and the vitality of the tasks awaiting the psychologists of the future, the winter of my discontent becomes tinged with the promise of a glorious summer, when all psychologists shall practice the sanity they preach. End of Has Psychology Failed? Recording by John Thomas Coos, John Thomas Coos was Marsky, www.thenerdcoach.com. Studies of Interference in Serial Verbal Reactions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Pasadena, California Studies of Interference in Serial Verbal Reactions by J. Ridley Stroop 
George Peabody College, first published in Journal of Experimental Psychology, 18, 643 through 662. Introduction. Interference or inhibition, this term seems to have been used almost indiscriminately, has been given a large place in experimental literature. The investigation was begun by the physiologists prior to 1890, Bodwich and Warren, J.W., 1890, and has been continued into the present principally by psychologists, Lester, 1932. Of the numerous studies that have been published during this period, only a limited number of the most relevant reports demand our attention here. Munsterberg, 1892, studied the inhibiting effects of changes in common daily habits such as opening the door of his room, dipping his pen in ink, and taking his watch out of his pocket. He concluded that a given association can function automatically, even though some effect of a previous contrary association remains. Mueller and Schumann, 1894, discovered that more time was necessary to relearn a series of nonsense syllables if the stimulus syllables had been associated with other syllables in the meantime. From their results, they deduced the law of associative inhibition, which is quoted by Klein, 1921, page 270, as follows. If A is already connected with B, then it is difficult to connect it with K. B gets in the way. Nonsense syllables were also used by Shepard and Fogelsanger, 1913, in a series of experiments on association and inhibition. Only three subjects were used in any experiment, and the changes introduced to produce the inhibition were so great in many cases as to present novel situations. This latter fact was shown by introspections. The results showed an increase in time for the response which corresponded roughly to the increase in the complexity of the situation. The only conclusion was stated thus. We have found that in acquiring associations, there is involved an inhibitory process which is not a mere result of the divided paths, but has some deeper basis yet unknown. Page 311. Klein, 1921, used meaningful material, states and capitals, counties and county seats, and books and authors, in a study of interference effects of associations. He found that if the first associative bond had a recall power of 10% or less, it facilitated the second association. If it had recall power of 15% to 40%, the inhibitory power was small. If it had a recall power of 45% to 70%, the inhibiting strength approached a maximum. And if the recall power was 70% to 100%, the inhibition was of medium strength and in some cases might disappear or even facilitate the learning of a new association. In card sorting, Bergstrom, 1893 and 1894, Brown, 1914, Blair, 1902, and Collar, 1912, found that changing the arrangement of compartments into which cards were being sorted produced interference effects. Bergstrom, 1894, page 441, concluded that the interference effect of an association bears a constant relation to the practice effect and is, in fact, equivalent to it. Both Blair and Kohler found that the interference of the opposing habits disappeared if the habits were practiced alternately. Kohler, 1912, in the paper already referred to, reported two other experiments. In one experiment, the subjects associated each of a series of numbers with striking a particular key on the typewriter with a particular finger. Then the keys were changed so that four of the numbers had to be written with fingers other than those formerly used to write them. In the other experiment, the subjects were trained to react with the right hand to red and with the left hand to blue. Then the stimuli were interchanged. In the former experiment, an interference was found which decreased rapidly with practice. In the latter experiment, the interference was overbalanced by the practice effect. Hunter and Yarbrough, 1917, Pierce, 1917, and Hunter, 1922, in three closely related studies of habit interference in the white rat in a T-shaped discrimination box, found 
that a previous habit interfered with the formation of an opposite habit. Several studies have been published which are not primarily studies of interference, but which employed materials that were similar in nature to those employed in this research, and which are concerned with why it takes more time to name colors than to read color names. Several of these studies have been reviewed by Telford, 1930, and Ligon, 1932. Only the vital part of these studies will be mentioned here. The difference in time for naming colors and reading color names has been variously explained. Cattell, 1886, and Lund, 1927, have attributed the difference to practice. Woodworth and Wells, 1911, page 52, have suggested that the real mechanism here may very well be the mutual interference of the five names, all of which, from immediately preceding use, are on the tip of the tongue. All are equally ready and likely to get in one another's way. Brown, 1915, page 51, concluded that the difference in speed between color naming and word reading does not depend upon practice, but that page 34. The association process in naming simple objects like colors is radically different from the association process in reading printed words. Garrett and Lemon, 1924, page 438, have accounted for their findings in these words. Hence it seems reasonable to say that interferences which arise in naming colors are due not so much to an equal readiness of the color names as to an equal readiness of the color recognitive process. Another factor present in interference is, very probably, the present strength of the associations between colors and their names, already determined by past use. Peterson, 1918 and 1925, has attributed the difference to the fact that one particular response habit has become associated with each word, while, in the case of colors themselves, a variety of response tendencies have developed. 1925, page 281. As pointed out by Telford, 1930, the results published by Peterson, 1925, page 281, and also published by Lund, 1927, page 425, confirm Peterson's interpretation. Ligon, 1932, has published results of a genetic study of naming colors and reading color names in which he used 638 subjects from school grades 1 to 9 inclusive. In the light of his results, he found all former explanations untenable. He included no examination of or reference to Peterson's data and interpretation and proceeded to set up a new hypothesis based on a three-factor theory a common factor which he never definitely describes, and special factors of word reading and color naming. He points out that the common factor is learned, but the special factors are organic. He promises further evidence from studies now in progress. The present problem grew out of experimental work in color naming and word reading conducted in Jessup Psychological Laboratory at George Peabody College for Teachers. The time for reading names of colors has been compared with the time for naming colors themselves. This suggests a comparison of the interfering effect of color stimuli upon reading names of colors, the two types of stimuli being presented simultaneously, with the interfering effect of word stimuli upon naming colors themselves. In other words, if the word red is printed in blue ink, how would the interference of the ink color blue upon reading the printed word red compare with the interference of the printed word red upon calling the name of the ink color blue? The increase in time for reacting to words caused by the presence of conflicting color stimuli is taken as the measure of the interference of color stimuli upon reading words. The increase in the time for reacting to colors caused by the presence of conflicting word stimuli is taken as the measure of the interference of word stimuli upon naming colors. A second problem grew out of the results of the first. The problem was, what effect would practice in reacting to the color stimuli in the presence of conflicting word stimuli 
have upon the reaction times in the two situations described in the first problem. Experiment 1. The effect of interfering color stimuli upon reading names of colors serially. Materials. When this experiment was contemplated, the first task was to arrange suitable tests. The colors used on the Woodworth Wells color sheet were considered, but two changes were deemed advisable. As the word test to be used in comparison with the color test was to be printed in black, it seemed well to substitute another color for black as an interfering stimulus. Also, because of the difficulty of printing words in yellow that would approximate the stimulus intensity of the other colors used, yellow was discarded. After consulting with Dr. Peterson, black and yellow were replaced by brown and purple. Hence, the colors used were red, blue, green, brown, and purple. The colors were arranged so as to avoid any regularity of occurrence, and so that each color would appear twice in each column and in each row, and that no color would immediately succeed itself in either column or row. The words were also arranged so that the name of each color would appear twice in each line. No word was printed in the color it named, but an equal number of times in each of the other four colors, i.e., the word red was printed in blue, green, brown, and purple inks. The word blue was printed in red, green, brown, and purple inks. The word blue was printed in red, green, brown, and purple inks, etc. No word immediately succeeded itself in either column or row. The test was printed from 14-point Franklin lowercase type. The word arrangement was duplicated in black print from the same type. Each test was also printed in the reverse order, which provided a second form. The tests will be known as reading color names where the color of the print and the word are different, RCND, and reading color names printed in black, RCNB. Subjects and Procedure 70 college undergraduates, 14 males and 56 females, were used as subjects. Every subject read two whole sheets, the two forms, of each test at one sitting. One half of the subjects of each sex, selected at random, read the tests in the order RCNB, Form 1, RCND, Form 2, RCND, Form 1, and RCNB, Form 2, while the other half reversed the order, thus equating for practice and fatigue on each test and form. All subjects were seated so as to have good daylight illumination from the left side only. All subjects were in the experimental room a few minutes before beginning work to allow the eyes to adjust to light conditions. The subjects were volunteers and apparently motivation was good. A ten word sample was read before the first reading of each test. The instructions were to read as quickly as possible and to leave no errors uncorrected. When an error was left, the subject's attention was called to that fact as soon as the sheet was finished. On the signal, ready, go, the sheet which the subject held face down was termed by the subject and read aloud. The words were followed on another sheet, in black print, by the experimenter, and the time was taken with a stopwatch to a fifth of a second. Contrary to instructions, 14 subjects left a total of 24 errors uncorrected on the RCND test. Four was the maximum for any subject, and four other subjects left one error each on the RCNB test. As each subject made 200 reactions on each test, this small number of errors was considered negligible. The work was done under good daylight illumination. Results Table 1 gives the means, standard deviations, differences, probable error of the difference, and the reliability of the difference for the whole group for each sex. Observation of the bottom line on the table shows that it took an average of 2.3 seconds longer to read 100 color names printed in colors different from that named by the word than to read the same names printed in black. This difference is not reliable, which is in agreement with Peterson's predictions made when the test was first proposed. The means for the sex groups shows no particular difference. An examination of the means and standard deviations for the two tests 
shows that the interference factor caused a slight increase in the variability for the whole group and for the female group, but a slight decrease for the male group. Table 2 presents the same data arranged on the basis of college classification. Only college years 1 and 2 contain a sufficient number of cases for comparative purposes. They show no differences that approach reliability. Experiment 2. The effect of interfering word stimuli upon naming colors serially. Materials. For this experiment, the colors of the words in the RCND task, described in Experiment 1, were printed in the same order but in the form of solid squares from 24-point type instead of words. This sort of problem will be referred to as the naming color test in C. The RCND test was employed also, but in a very different manner from that in Experiment 1. In this experiment, the colors of the print on the series of names were to be called in succession, ignoring the colors named by the words, e.g., where the word red was printed in blue, it was to be called blue. Where it was to be printed in green, it was to be called green. Where the word brown was printed in red, it was to be called red, etc. Thus the color of the print was to be the controlling stimuli and not the name of the color spelled by the word. This is to be known as the naming color or word test where the color of the print and the word are different in CWD. See Appendix B. Subjects and Procedure 100 students, 88 college undergraduates, 29 males and 59 females, and 12 graduate students, all females, served as subjects. Every subject read two whole sheets, the two forms, of each test at one sitting. Half of the subjects read in the order in C, in CWD, in CWD, in C, and the other half in the order in CWD, in C, in C, in CWD, thus equating for practice and fatigue on the two tests. All subjects were seated in their individual tests near the window so as to have good daylight illumination from the left side. Each subject seemed to make a real effort. A 10-word sample of each test was read before reading the test the first time. The instructions were to name the colors as they appeared in regular reading lines as quickly as possible and to correct all errors. The methods of starting, checking errors, and timing were the same as those used in Experiment 1. The errors were recorded, and for each error not corrected, twice the average time per word for the reading of the sheet on which the error was made was added to the time taken by the stopwatch. This plan of correction was arbitrary, but seemed to be justified by the situation. There were two kinds of failures to be accounted for. First, the failure to see the error, and second, the failure to correct it. Each phase of the situation gave the subject a time advantage which deserved taking note of. Since no accurate objective measure was obtained and the number of errors was small, the arbitrary plan was adopted. 59% of the group left an average of 2.6 errors uncorrected on the NCWD test, 200 reactions, and 32% of the group left an average of 1.2 errors uncorrected on the NC test. 200 reactions. The correction changed the mean of the NCWD test from 108.7 to 110.3 and the mean of the NC test from 63.0 to 63.3. Results. The means of the times for the NC and the NCWD tests for the whole group and for each sex are presented in Table 3 along with the difference, the probable error of the difference, the reliability of the difference, and the difference divided by the mean time for the naming color test. The comparison of the results for the whole group on the NC and the NCWD test given the bottom line of the table indicates the strength of the interference of the habit of calling words upon the activity of naming colors. 
the mean time for 100 responses is increased from 63.3 seconds to 110.3 seconds, or an increase of 74%. The medians on the two tests are 61.9 and 110.4 seconds, respectively. The standard deviation is increased in approximately the same ratio, from 10.8 to 18.8. The coefficient of variability remains the same to the third decimal place, s over m equals 0.171. The difference between means may be better evaluated when expressed in terms of the variability of the group. The difference of 47 seconds is 2.5 standard deviation units in terms of the NCWD test, or 4.35 standard deviation units on the NC test. The former shows that 99% of the group on the NCWD test was above the mean on the NC test, took more time, and the latter shows that the group as scored on the NC test was well below the mean on the NCWD test. These results are shown graphically in Figure 1, where histograms and normal curves obtained by the Gaussian formula of the two sets of data are superimposed. The small area in which the curves overlap and a 74% increase in the mean time for naming colors caused by the presence of word stimuli show the marked interference effect of the habitual response of calling words. The means for the sex groups on the NCWD test show a difference of 3.6 seconds, which is only 1.16 times its probable error but the means on the NC test have a difference of 8.2 seconds, which is 5.17 times its probable error. This reliable sex difference favoring the females in naming colors agrees with the findings of Woodworth Wells, 1911, Brown, 1915, Ligon, 1932, etc. The same data are arranged according to college classification in Table 4. There is some indication of improvement of the speed factor for both tests as the college rank improves. The relative difference between the two tests, however, remains generally the same, except for fluctuations which are probably due to the variation in the number of cases. Experiment 3. The Effects of Practice Upon Interference Materials The tests used were the same in character as those described in Experiments 1 and 2. RCNB, RCND, NC, and NCWD, with some revision. The NC test was printed in swastikas instead of squares. Such a modification allowed white to appear in the figure with the color, as is the case when the color is presented in the printed word. This change also made it possible to print the NC test in shades which more nearly match those in the NCWD test. The order of colors was determined under one restriction other than those given in Section 2. Each line contained one color whose two appearances were separated by only one other color. This was done to equate, as much as possible, the difficulty of the different lines of the test so that any section of five lines would approximate the difficulty of any other section of five lines. Two forms of the test were printed. In one, the order was the inverse of that in the other. Subjects and Procedure 32 undergraduates in the University of Arizona, 17 males and 15 females, who offered their services were the subjects. At each day's sitting, four half-sheets of the same test were read, and the average time after correction was made for errors according to the plan outlined in Experiment 2 were recorded as the day's score. Only a few errors were left uncorrected. The largest correction made on the practice test changed the mean from 49.3 to 49.6. The plan of experimentation was as follows. On the first day, the RCNB test was used to acquaint the subjects with the experimental procedure and improve the reliability of the second day's test. The RCNB test was given the second day and the thirteenth day to obtain a measure of the interference developed by practice on the NC and NCWD tests.
the rcn d test was given on the fourteenth day to get a measure of the effect of a day's practice upon the newly developed interference the n c test was given on the third and twelfth days just before and just after the real practice series so that actual change in interference on the n c w d test might be known the test schedule was followed in regular daily order with two exceptions there were two days between test days three and four and also between test days eight and nine in which no work was done these irregularities were occasioned by weekends each subject was assigned a regular time of day for his work throughout the experiment all but two subjects followed the schedule with very little irregularity these two were finally dropped from the group and their data rejected all of these tests were given individually by the author the subject was seated near a window so as to have good daylight illumination from the left side there was no other source of light every subject was in the experimental room for a few minutes before beginning work to allow his eyes to adapt to the light conditions to aid eye adaptation and to check for clearness of vision, each subject read several lines in a current magazine. Every subject was given Dr. Ishihara's tests for color vision. One subject was found to have some trouble with red-green color vision, and her results were discarded, though they differed from others of her sex only in the number of errors made and corrected. Results the general results for the whole series of tests are shown in Table 5, which presents the means, standard deviations, and coefficients of variability for the whole group and for each sex separately, together with a measure of sex difference in terms of the probable error of the difference. Table 6, which is derived from Table 5, summarizes the practice effects upon their respective tests. The graphical representation of the results in the practice series gives the learning curve presented in Figure 2. The effect of practice on the NCW test upon itself. The data to be considered here are those given in the section of Table 5 under the caption, Days of Practice on the NCWD Test. They are also presented in summary in the left section of Table 6 and graphically in Figure 2. From all three presentations, it is evident that the time score is lowered considerably by practice. Reference to Table 6 shows a gain of 16.8 seconds, or 33.9% of the mean of the first day's practice. The practice curve is found to resemble very much the typical learning curve when constructed on time units. The coefficient of variability is increased from 0.14 plus or minus 0.012 to 0.19 plus or minus 0.015. This difference divided by its probable error gives 2.60, which indicates that it is not reliable. The probability of a real increase in variability, however, is 24 to 1. Hence, practice on the NCWD test serves to increase individual differences. An examination of the data of sex groups reveals a difference in speed on the NCWD test which favors the females. This is to be expected as there is a difference in favor of females in naming colors. Though the difference is not reliable in any one case, it exists throughout the practice series, indicating that the relative improvement is approximately the same for the two groups. This latter fact is also shown by the ratio of the difference between the halves of practice series to the first half. It is 0.185 for the males and 0.180 for the females. The effect of practice on the NCWD test upon the NC test. The middle section of Table 6 shows a gain on the NC test of 4.0 seconds, or 13.9% of the initial score. This is only 23.7% of the gain on the NCWD test, which means that less than one-fourth of the total gain on the NCWD test is due to increase in speed in naming colors. The improvement is greater for the males, which is accounted for by the fact that there is more difference between naming colors and reading names of colors for the males than for the females. 
the effects in the RCND test of practice on the NCWD and NC tests. The right section of Table 6 shows that the practice on the NCWD and NC tests resulted in heavy loss in speed on the RCND test. A comparison of the right and left sections of the table shows that the loss on RCND test, when measured in absolute units, is practically equal to the gain on the NCWD test. When measured in relative units, it is much greater. It is interesting to find that in 10 short practice periods, the relative values of opposing stimuli can be modified so greatly. There is little relation, however, between the gain in one case and the loss in the other. The correlation between gain and loss in absolute units is 0.262 plus or minus 0.11, while the correlation between percent of gain and percent of loss is 0.016 plus or minus 0.17, or 0. This is what one might expect. From a consideration of the results of the two applications of the RCND test given in the final tests of Table 5, it is evident that the newly developed interference disappears very rapidly with practice. From one day to the next, the mean decreases from 34.8 to 22.0 seconds. This indicates that renewing the effectiveness of old associations which are being opposed by newly formed ones is easier than strengthening new associations in opposition to old, well-established ones. The variability of the group is increased by the increase in interference due to practice on the NCWD test. The coefficient of variability increases from 0.15 plus or minus 0.013 to 0.34 plus or minus 0.031, the difference divided by its probable error being 5.65. This is not surprising, as the degree of the interference varies widely from different subjects. Its degree is determined by the learning on the practice series, which is shown by the individual results to vary considerably. One day's practice on the RCND test reduced the variability from 0.34 plus or minus 0.031 to 0.25 plus or minus 0.022. The decrease in variability is 2.3 times its probable error. The data from this experiment present interesting findings on the effect of practice upon individual differences. The results, which have already been discussed separately, are presented for comparison in Table 7. These results show that practice increases individual differences where a stimulus to which the subjects have a habitual reaction pattern is interfering with reactions to a stimulus for which the subjects do not have a habitual reaction pattern, the word stimulus interfering with naming colors in CWD test, but decreases individual differences where a stimulus to which the subjects do not have a habitual reaction pattern is interfering with reactions to a stimulus in which the subjects have a habitual reaction pattern, the color stimulus interfering with reading words, RCND test. There are two other variables involved, however, initial variability and length of practice. Thus, in the NCWD test, the initial variability was less, the difficulty greater, and the practice greater than in the RCND test. These findings lend some support to Peterson's hypothesis. Subjects with normal heterogeneity would become more alike with practice on the simpler processes or activities, but more different on the more complex activities. Peterson and Barlow, 1928, page 228. A sex difference in naming colors has been found by all who have studied color naming and has been generally attributed to the greater facility of women in verbal reactions than of men. There is some indication in our data that this sex difference may be due to the difference in the accustomed reactions of the two sexes to colors as stimuli. In other words, responding to a color stimulus by naming the color may be more common with females than with males. This difference is probably built up through education. 
education in color is much more intense for girls than for boys as observing naming and discussing colors relative to dress is more common among girls than among boys the practice in naming colors in the ncwd test decreased the difference between the sex groups on the nc test from a difference 5.38 times its probable error to a difference 2.99 times its probable error this decrease in the difference due to practice favors the view that difference has been acquired and is therefore a product of training. Summary 1. Interference in serial verbal reactions has been studied by means of newly devised experimental materials. The source of the interference is in the materials themselves. The words red, blue, green, brown, and purple are used on the test sheet. No word is printed in the color it names, but an equal number of times in each of the other four colors, i.e., the word red is printed in blue, green, brown, and purple inks. The word blue is printed in red, green, brown, and purple inks, etc. Thus, each word presents the name of one color printed in ink of another color. Hence, a word stimulus and a color stimulus both are presented simultaneously. The words of the test are duplicated in black print, and the colors of the test are duplicated in squares or swastikas. The difference in the time for reading the words printed in colors and the same words printed in black is the measure of interference of color stimuli upon reading words. The difference in the time for naming the colors in which the words are printed and the same colors printed in squares or swastikas is the measure of the interference of conflicting word stimuli upon naming colors. 2. The interference of conflicting color stimuli upon the time for reading 100 words, each word naming a color unlike the ink color of its print, caused an increase of only 2.3 seconds or 5.6% over the normal time for reading the same words printed in black. This increase is not reliable, but the interference of conflicting word stimuli upon the time for naming 100 colors, each color being the print of a word which names another color, caused an increase of 47 seconds, or 74.3% of the normal time for naming colors printed in squares. These tests provide a unique basis, the interference value, for comparing the effectiveness of the two types of associations. Since the presence of the color stimuli caused no reliable increase over the normal time for reading words, d over PE sub d equals 3.64, and the presence of word stimuli caused a considerable increase over the normal time for naming colors, 4.35 standard deviation units, the associations that have been formed between the word stimuli and the reading response are evidently more effective than those that have been formed between the color stimuli and the naming response. Since these associations are products of training, and since the difference in their strength corresponds roughly to the difference in training in reading words and naming colors, it seems reasonable to conclude that the difference in speed in reading names of colors and in naming colors may be satisfactorily accounted for by the difference in training in the two activities. The word stimulus has been associated with the specific response to read, while the color stimulus has been associated with various responses to admire, to name, to reach for, to avoid, etc. 3. As a test of the permanency of the interference of conflicting word stimuli to naming colors eight days practice, 200 reactions per day, were given in naming colors of the print of words, each word naming a color unlike the ink color of its print. The effects of this practice were as follows. 1. It decreased the interference of conflicting word stimuli to naming colors, but did not eliminate it. 2. It produced a practice curve comparable to that obtained in many other learning experiments. 3. It increased the variability of the group. 4. It shortened the reaction time to colors presented in color squares. 5. It increased the interference of conflicting color stimuli upon reading words. 
before, practice was found either to increase or to decrease the variability of the group depending on the nature of the material used. 5. Some indication was found that sex difference in naming colors is due to the difference in the training of the two sexes. Manuscript received August 15, 1934. Footnotes 1. The writer wishes to acknowledge the kind assistance received in the preparation of this thesis. He is indebted to Dr. Joseph Peterson for encouragement, helpful suggestions, and criticism of the manuscript. To Major H. W. Finker, a graduate student in psychology, for helpful suggestions relative to preparation of the manuscript. To Drs. J. Peterson, S. C. Garrison, M. R. Schnick, J. E. Castor, O. A. Simley, W. F. Smith, and to Miss M. Nichol for aid in securing subjects to some 300 college students who served as subjects, to William Fitzgerald of the Peabody Press for substantial assistance in the printing of the test materials. 2. Discordis, 1914, and also Goodenough and Bryan, 1929, presented color and form simultaneously in studying their relative values as stimuli. 3. In Appendix A will be found a key to all symbols and abbreviations used in this paper. Appendix A, a key to symbols and abbreviations. NC, naming colors. NCWD, naming the colors of the print words where the color of the print and the word are different. RCNB, reading color names printed in black ink. RCND, reading color names where the color of the print and the word are different. D difference. D over P E sub D. Difference divided by the probable error of the difference. M and F, males and females. P E sub D, probable error of the difference. S, sigma or standard deviation. S over M, standard deviation divided by the mean. End of studies of interference in serial verbal reactions. Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Pasadena, California. Two types of conditioned reflex and a pseudotype. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester. 2012. Two types of conditioned reflex and a pseudotype. Accepted for publication by Carl Murchison of the Editorial Board and received in the Editorial Office June 4th, 1934. From the Biological Laboratories of Harvard University. B. F. Skinner, 1935. Society of Fellows, Harvard University. First published in Journal of General Psychology 12, pages 66 to 77. A conditioned reflex is said to be conditioned in the sense of being dependent for its existence or state upon the occurrence of a certain kind of event having to do with the presentation of a reinforcing stimulus. A definition that includes much more than this simple notion will probably not be applicable to all cases. At almost any significant level of analysis, a distinction must be made between at least two major types of conditioned reflex. These may be represented with examples in the following way, where S equals stimulus, R equals response, brackets S hyphen R, brackets equals reflex, right pointing arrow equals is followed by and square brackets equals the strength of the enclosed reflex. Diagram Type 1 A S subscript 0 lever reflex R subscript 0 pressing which is followed by S subscript 1 food Reflex, R subscript 1, salivation, eating. 
B. S subscript 0, lever, reflex, R subscript 0, pressing, which is followed by S subscript 1, shock, reflex, R subscript 1, withdraw, emotional change. Type 2. S prime subscript 0, light, reflex, R prime subscript 0, gamma, not important, which is followed by S prime subscript 1, food, reflex, R prime subscript 1, salivation, eating. In parallel, D. S prime subscript 0, light, reflex, R prime subscript 0, gamma, not important, which is followed by S prime subscript 1, shock, reflex, R prime subscript 1, flexion, emotional change. The conditioned reflex is shown by a dashed line connecting S prime subscript 0, light, and R prime subscript 1, salivation, eating, flexion, emotional change. End diagram. Given such a sequence, where the strength of S subscript 1 reflex R subscript 1 is approximately equal to nothing, footnote, this expression specifies the presence of some amount of drive, Skinner, B.F., Drive and Reflex Strength, 1, Journal of General Psychology, 1932, 6, pages 22 to 37. End footnote. Conditioning occurs as a change in the strength of S subscript 0, reflex R subscript 0. An increase in strength, positive conditioning, in A, and a decrease, negative conditioning, in B. Given the simultaneous or successive presentations of S prime subscript 0 and S prime subscript 1, where the strength of S prime subscript 1 reflex R prime subscript 1 is approximately nothing, conditioning occurs as an increase in the strength of S prime subscript 0 reflex R prime subscript 1. Differences between the types are as follows. 1. In type 1, S subscript 0 is followed by R subscript 0 is followed by S subscript 1, where R subscript 0 necessarily intervenes between the stimuli. In type 2, S prime subscript 0 is followed by S prime subscript 1, where R prime subscript 0 is ignored. Footnote. For convenience, we shall omit the case of simultaneous stimuli in type 2. End footnote. In 1, R subscript 0 is important. It becomes the conditioned response. In 2, R prime subscript 0 is irrelevant, except when it is relevant in another sense by conflicting with R prime subscript 1, and may actually disappear. Since conditioning of the second type may take place even when S prime subscript 1 occurs after R prime subscript 0, paradigm 2, example C, may be written for this case as follows. Light, dashed line, R, dashed line, is followed by food, dashed line, salivation. When it is identical with 1, but the result is not to reduce the two types to a single form. Both kinds of conditioning proceed simultaneously but separately. If R is turning toward the light, for example, and if the food is withheld until turning takes place, the strength of light reflex turning will increase according to 1, while the strength of light reflex salivation will increase according to 2. The same result is obtained with negative conditioning. Example D gives, upon delaying S prime subscript 1, light, dashed line R, dashed line leads to shock, dashed line flexion, etc. Where the strength of light conditioned reflex R 
will decrease according to one, while the strength of light reflex flexion increases according to two. In the special case in which R subscript zero and R prime subscript one are of the same form, the two kinds can apparently not be separated. If, for example, some unconditioned salivation is supposed to be elicitable by a light, footnote, see difference four below for this general requirement in type one, end footnote, we may substitute salivation for R to obtain light hyphen salivation dashed line is followed by food reflex salivation two both the strength of light reflex salivation one and light reflex salivation two will increase with apparently no possible distinction this is a very special case and is also in no sense a reduction to a single type two in one s subscript zero reflex r subscript zero occurs normally in the absence of s subscript one reflex r subscript one and its strength may be measured without interfering with the reinforcing action of s subscript one in two s prime subscript one must be withheld whenever a measurement of the strength of s prime subscript zero reflex r prime subscript one the conditioned reflex is taken because s prime subscript one also evokes r prime subscript one some amount of extinction necessarily ensues in the second case three since s prime subscript one must be withheld in measuring the strength of s prime subscript zero reflex r prime subscript one r prime subscript one must be independent of any property of s prime subscript one not possessed by s prime subscript zero in example C, salivation may become attached to the light as a conditioned response of type 2, but seizing, chewing and swallowing, which are also responses to S' prime subscript 1, must not be included in the paradigm, since they require the presence of parts of S' prime subscript 1 which cannot be supplied by S' prime subscript 0. A special restriction on paradigm 2 is therefore necessary. Where S' prime subscript zero is of a very simple sort, a tone for example, the properties possessed in addition to S' prime subscript zero by S' prime subscript one are practically equal to S' prime subscript one. And we may express the restriction in terms of a general distinction between two kinds of response. The first kind require no external point of reference in their elicitation or description. Typical examples are glandular activities, salivation, local muscular responses, flexion, wink, breathing movements, production of sounds, and facilitation and inhibition. Footnote. Where condition facilitation and inhibition are defined by substituting for R' prime subscript 1 in paradigm 2 the expressions increase strength of S double prime reflex R double prime and decrease strength of s double prime reflex r double prime respectively end footnote the second kind require points of reference for their elicitation or description which are not supplied by the organism itself but by the stimulus examples are orientation towards the source of a sound approaching a light and touching seizing and manipulating objects such as a lever or food our present rule is that responses of the second kind cannot be substituted for r prime subscript one in paradigm two unless s prime also supplies the required points of reference four in type one the strength of s subscript zero reflex r subscript zero is approximately nothing before conditioning takes place the reflex to be conditioned must be elicited at least once as an unconditioned investigatory reflex in type 2 the strength of s prime subscript 0 reflex r prime subscript 1 may begin at 0 and usually does in type 1 the state of the reflex is conditioned by the occurrence of the reinforcing sequence but its existence is not a distinction between a conditioned and an unconditioned reflex is here less significant 
because all examples of the former have necessarily been examples of the latter. There are no exclusively conditioned reflexes in this type. Since the strength of S prime subscript zero reflex R prime subscript one may begin at zero, a new reflex may be created in conditioning of the second type. And since practically any stimulus may be attached to R prime subscript one in paradigm two, a very large number of new reflexes can thus be derived. Conditioning of type one, on the other hand, is not a device for increasing the repertory of reflexes. R subscript zero continues to be elicited by the one stimulus with which it began. There are three reflexes in paradigm two, but only two in one. Five, the significant change in type one may be either an increase or a decrease in strength. In type two, it is an increase only, even when the strength of S prime subscript zero reflex R prime subscript one does not begin at zero. In type one, stimuli may be divided into two classes, positively and negatively conditioning, according to whether they produce an increase or decrease when used as reinforcement. The distinction cannot be made in type two, where a reflex may be negative in another sense, a reflex of avoidance, for example, but where its strength only increases during conditioning. Six. In type one, the conditioned reflex, S subscript zero, reflex R subscript zero, may be associated with any drive, in type 2, the reflex S prime subscript 0 reflex R prime subscript 1 is necessarily attached to the drive specified by R prime subscript 1. This point may require some comment. In the present use of the term, a drive is an inferred variable of which the strength of a group of reflexes is a function. Reference Skinner, B.F. Drive and Reflex Strength, 1. Journal of General Psychology, 1932, 6, pages 22 to 37. End reference. Hunger, for example, is a variable, H, a change in which is responsible for concurrent changes in the strength, A, of all unconditioned reflexes concerned with the ingestion of food, B, of all conditioned reflexes of either type in which the reinforcing stimulus is concerned with the ingestion of food and c to a much lesser extent of all investigatory reflexes in paradigm one example a lever reflex pressing is originally a function of h to some slight extent under c above after conditioning it varies with h according to b over a wide range probably equal to that of any unconditioned reflex under A. Conditioning of type 1 is really the becoming attached to a group of reflexes varying as a function of some drive. This is a much more comprehensive description of the process than to define it as an increase in strength where the drive is assumed to remain constant at a significant value. But the identity of H in the present case is determined only by our choice of a reinforcing reflex. Given S subscript 1 reflex R subscript 1 of another drive, say thirst, then S subscript 0 reflex R subscript 0 will become conditioned by attaching itself to the group varying with thirst and will not vary with H except to some slight extent under C. This is a characteristic wholly lacking in type 2. Here, R prime is originally part of the unconditioned reflex and the drive to which it belongs is definitely fixed. 7. A minor difference is in the way in which the stimulus to be conditioned usually acts. In type 1, S subscript 0 is usually part of a larger field and R subscript 0 occurs as the result of the eventual potency of S subscript zero over other stimuli. In type two, S prime subscript zero is usually suddenly presented to the organism. The significance of this difference, which is not absolute, will appear later. We shall now consider a third type of relation, which involves a discrimination. It may be based upon a conditioned reflex of either type, 
but we shall begin with one. To establish a discrimination, subdivide S subscript 0 into two classes on the basis of a selected property or component member. Reference Skinner, B.F. The Rate of Establishment of a Discrimination Journal of General Psychology, 1933, 9, pages 302 to 350. Skinner, B.F. The Generic Nature of the Concepts of Stimulus and Response Journal of General Psychology, 1935, 12, pages 40 to 65. End reference. For example, let the lever stimulate either the presence of a light, L, when the stimulus may be written as S subscript A, B, L. Subscripts indicate properties or components. Or in the dark, when the stimulus is S subscript A, B. Continue to reinforce the re-response to one of them, say S subscript A, B, L and extinguish or negatively condition the response to the other by breaking the sequence at S subscript 1, or by introducing as S subscript 1 of the negatively conditioning kind. Difference 5. When this has been done, the strength of S subscript ABL, reflexes R subscript 0, is greater than the strength of S subscript AB, reflexes R subscript 0, and at any value of the underlying drive, such that S subscript ABL reflexes R subscript 0 is usually elicited, but S subscript AB reflexes R subscript 0 is not, there exists the following condition. Given an organism in the presence of S subscript AB ordinarily unresponsive, the presentation of L will be followed by a response. For the sake of comparison, we may set up a paradigm in imitation of two as follows. Diagram. Light is followed by a gamma response, not important. Simultaneously, the lever is followed by pressing. The conditioned reflex represented diagonally shows light being followed by pressing. End diagram. The relation between the light and the response to the lever might be called pseudo-conditioned reflex. It has some of the characteristics of type 2. The original response to the light is irrelevant, difference 1. The relation may be wholly absent prior to the conditioning, difference 4. It changes in a positive direction only, difference 5. And the stimulus is usually of the presented kind, difference 7. In all these respects it differs from type 1, although the example is based upon a reflex of that type. In many other respects it differs from both types. A reinforcing reflex is not included in the paradigm, but must be added as a third or fourth reflex. The response is not principally to the light, but to the lever. The light is only a component member of the whole stimulus, and light reflex pressing is not legitimately the expression of a reflex. The lever cannot be removed to show the conditioned effectiveness of the light as in type 2. Instead, the response to the lever alone must be extinguished, a characteristic that we have not met before. In spite of these differences, it is often said, in similar cases, that the light becomes the conditioned stimulus for the response to the lever, just as it becomes the stimulus for salivation. This is a confusion with type 2, which obviously arises from a neglect of the extinguished reflex. The relation of pressing the lever to the lever itself is ignored and only the relation to the light taken into account. The lever comes to be treated not as a source of stimulation, but as part of the apparatus, relevant to the response only for mechanical reasons. When the discrimination is based upon a response not requiring an external point of reference, difference 3. The chance of this neglect increases enormously. If we substitute flexion of a leg for pressing of a lever and continue for the moment with type 1, S subscript 0 in paradigm 1 is not directly observable. We simply wait until a flexion appears, then reinforce. Having established S prime subscript 0 reflex R prime subscript 0 as a conditioned reflex of some strength, we subdivide our inferred S subscript 0 as before 
extinguish s subscript a b reflex r subscript zero and reinforce s subscript a b l reflex r subscript zero when the discrimination has been set up we have a condition in which the organism is ordinarily unresponsive but immediately responds with flexion upon presentation of the light our inability to demonstrate s subscript zero makes it difficult to show the discriminative nature of this relation but it is by no means impossible to find other grounds as we may see by comparing it with a true reflex of type two let the presentation of the light be followed by a shock to the foot until the light alone elicits flexion the resulting reflex is superficially similar to the relation of light and flexion that we have just examined but fundamentally the two cases are unlike assuming that no immediate difference can in fact be detected footnote this is a generous assumption since some evidence for the presence of s subscript zero can usually be found a difference in the character of the response might also be shown in the case of the true reflex it may be accompanied by changes in breathing rate for example which would be lacking in the pseudo reflex End footnote. we may still show differences by referring forward or backward to the history of the organism the two relations have been established in different ways and their continued existence depends upon reinforcement from different stimuli the discriminative drive relation also varies with an arbitrarily chosen drive while the conditioned reflex is necessarily attached to the drive to which shock reflex flexion belongs these differences are chiefly due however to the use of a conditioned reflex of type one in setting up the discrimination in a pseudo conditioned reflex based upon type two the distinction is much less sure here we are invariably able to neglect the extinguished member because r prime subscript one is of the kind not requiring an external point of reference difference three and we can minimize its importance in other ways given a conditioned reflex of this kind diagram tone is followed by a gamma response not important in parallel food is followed by salivation the conditioned reflex is represented diagonally tone is followed by salivation end diagram if we establish a discrimination between the tone and the tone plus a light reinforcing the response to the latter we obtain the following condition an organism in the presence of the tone ordinarily unresponsive will respond upon presentation of the light the only difference between this relation and a true reflex of type two is the extinction of the response to the tone which is evidence that a discrimination has taken place the reinforcement of tone and light should condition responses to both of these stimuli but we observe that the organism is unresponsive in the presence of the tone alone now this surviving difference may be reduced at will by reducing the significance of s prime subscript zero in the basic reflex of the pseudotype if we lower the intensity of the tone or choose another stimulus of a less important kind we may approach as closely as we please to a conditioned reflex of type two we cannot actually reach type two in this way but we can easily reach a point at which our pseudo reflex is identical with any actual experimental example of that type this is true because some amount of discrimination is practically always involved in cases of type two when we put a dog into a stand present a light and then food the food reinforces not only the light but the stimulation from the stand merely putting the dog into the stand again should elicit salivation according to paradigm two in practice this is a disturbing effect which must be eliminated through extinction so long as it occurs any actual case of type two must be formulated as a pseudo conditioned reflex if s subscript g is the stimulation affecting the organism in addition to s subscript zero then s subscript zero in paradigm two should read s subscript g plus s subscript zero the effect upon s subscript g is extinguished through lack of reinforcement in the absence of s subscript zero and the result is a discrimination 
an organism in the presence of S subscript G, ordinarily unresponsive, responds when S subscript 0 is added. The importance of this criticism will depend upon the relative magnitudes of S subscript G and S subscript 0. In the optimal experiment S subscript G may be reduced to a value that is insignificant in comparison with ordinary values of S subscript 0. The partially discriminative nature of type 2 is inevitable. It is not important in type 1 because of difference 1. Paradigm 1 contains an implicit specification that S subscript 0 is active or has just acted at the moment of reinforcement since it specifies that S subscript 1 is to be withheld until R subscript 0 has occurred. The reinforced stimulus is really S subscript 0 and not S subscript G plus S subscript 0. It is the lever, in our example, not the whole stimulating field presented by the apparatus. Paradigm 2 contains no specification of the activity of S subscript 0 and the reinforcing action of S prime subscript 1 must be supposed to extend to S subscript G as well as to S subscript 0. In practice, an active state at the moment of reinforcement is usually ensured by presenting S subscript 0 suddenly. Footnote. This is our explanation of difference 7. Another explanation might be added. If S prime subscript 0 is active for any length of time prior to S subscript 1, it will have an extinguishing effect. This cannot be said of type 1. End footnote. This might be included as an additional provision in paradigm 2, but the provision really required is that S subscript 0 and no part of S subscript G be active at the moment of reinforcement. This is not easily arranged. We cannot wholly avoid the generalised action of the reinforcement in type 2 because of the lack of dependence of S prime subscript 1 upon R prime subscript 0. One characteristic of the pseudo-conditioned reflex is the variety of the forms of its stimulus. We have assumed that in our two fundamental paradigms any stimulus had ultimately the dimensions of energy, although we have often used the shorthand device of speaking of the source of energy, as for example, lever. In the pseudotype, however, the stimulus can be a single property. It can be the intensity of the stimulus or some such qualitative aspect as pitch or hue. It can be a change from one value of a property to another or the absence of a property or a duration. The reason why this is possible is that the other properties of the stimulus can be relegated to S subscript G for extinction. If the pitch of a tone is to be a conditioned stimulus, the tone itself must first become one also, and the response to its other properties must be extinguished by extinguishing the response to tones of other pitches. In a true conditioned reflex, this cannot be done. Although it is common to speak of properties as stimuli, reference, Pavlov, IP, Conditioned Reflexes, translated and edited by G. V. Anrep, London, Oxford University Press, 1927. End reference. The presence of a property in the position of a stimulus is a certain indication that a pseudo-conditioned reflex is really in question. A property alone cannot be used in either true type, because it implies extinction. Most of the real stimulus must be relegated to S subscript G, and the requirement that the value of S subscript G be negligible cannot therefore be satisfied. The position of a pseudo-conditioned reflex may be summarised as follows. When the pseudo-reflex is based upon a reflex of type 1, and when R subscript 0 requires external points of reference, there are important practical and theoretical reasons why a separate formulation is demanded. When R subscript 0 does not require external points of reference, there are fewer differences, but a separate formulation is still necessary. When the pseudotype is based upon a reflex of type 2, the distinction is weakened, but should still be made, except when S subscript G can be reduced to a very low value relative to S subscript 0. In the last case, a practical distinction is impossible, not because of an identity of types, but because of the failure of type 2 to appear experimentally in a pure form.
It is a tempting hypothesis that two is not an authentic type, but may be reduced to a discrimination based on type one. But this has not been shown. We have not reduced the pseudotype to type two, or vice versa, nor have we come very near it. The present pseudo-reflex, which resembles two most closely, requires of that type for its establishment. It is probably more than a coincidence that a discrimination based upon type one has so many of the properties of two, but the reduction to a single type appears from our present evidence to be highly improbable, desirable though it would be, as an immense simplification. The differences that we have noted are not easily disposed of. Still more improbable is a reduction of one to two, since the first step supplied by the pseudotype is then lacking. To the differences we have listed might be added differences in the parts played by the two types in the economy of the organism. The essence of type two is the substitution of one stimulus for another or, as Pavlov has put it, signalization. Reference Pavlov, I.P. Conditioned Reflexes, translated and edited by G. V. Anrep, London, Oxford University Press, 1927. End reference. It prepares the organism by obtaining the elicitation of a response before the original stimulus has begun to act, and it does this by letting any stimulus that has incidentally accompanied or anticipated the original stimulus act in its stead. In type 1, there is no substitution of stimuli and consequently no signalization. Type 1 acts in another way. The organism selects from a large repertory of unconditioned reflexes those of which the repetition is important with respect to certain elementary functions and discards those of which it is unimportant. The conditioned response of type 1 does not prepare for the reinforcing stimulus. It produces it. The stimulus to be conditioned is never in any sense incidental. Type 1 plays the more important role. When an organism comes accidentally, footnote, that is to say, as the result of weak investigatory reflexes, end footnote, upon a new kind of food which it seizes and eats, both kinds of conditioning presumably occur. When the visible radiation from the food next stimulates the organism, Salivation is evoked according to paradigm 2. This secretion remains useless until the food is actually seized and eaten. But seizing and eating will depend upon the same accidental factors as before, unless conditioning of type 1 has also occurred, that is, unless the strength of the reflex, food seizing, has increased. Thus, while a reflex of type 2 prepares the organism, a reflex of type 1 obtains the food for which the preparation is made. And this is in general a fair characterization of the relative importance of the two types. As Pavlov has said, conditioned stimuli are important in providing saliva before food is received, but, quote, even greater is their importance when they evoke the motor component of the complex reflex of nutrition, i.e., when they act as stimuli to the reflex of seeking food. End quote. Footnote. This is a doubly interesting statement because Pavlov has confined his own investigations practically exclusively to conditioned reflexes of the second type. It ought to be said that he usually regards this type as adequate for the whole field. Thus he says that the function of the hemispheres is signalization, although signalization is, as we have seen, a characteristic of type 2 only. Although the reflex of seeking food is an unfortunate expression, it refers clearly enough to behaviour characteristic of type 1. End of Two Types of Conditioned Reflex and a Pseudotype On Two Types of Conditioned Reflex this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Siddharth. On Two Types of Conditioned Reflex by J. Konorsky and S. Miller, 1937. First published in Journal of General Psychology, 16, pages 264 to 272. 
Skinner's paper on two types of conditioned reflex is of considerable interest as an attempt to introduce more clarity and precision than has been formally done into that old and often discussed topic of conditioned reflex. In his paper, which is based on his former experimental findings and on certain theoretical considerations of his own concerning gentle nature of the reflex, Skinner gives two following paradigms in which S is stimulus, R is response, S line R is reflex, dashed line is followed by diagram type 1. A S subscript 0, lever, reflex R subscript 0, pressing is followed by S subscript 1, food, reflex R subscript 1, salivation, eating B S subscript 0, lever, reflex R subscript 0, pressing which is followed by S subscript 1, shock, reflex R subscript 1, withdrawal, emotional change, end of diagram. Given such a sequence, conditioning occurs as a change in strength of S subscript 0, reflex R subscript 0, an increase in A and a decrease in B. Diagram type 2. C. S. Prime subscript 0. Light. Reflex. R. Prime subscript 0. Gamma. Not important. Is concurrent with S. Prime subscript 1. Food. Reflex. R. Prime subscript 1. Salivation. Eating. D. S. Prime subscript 0. Light. Reflex R prime subscript zero gamma not important is concurrent with S prime subscript one shock reflex R prime subscript one flexion emotional change the conditioned reflex is shown by a diagonal line connecting S prime subscript zero light to R prime subscript one salivation eating flexion emotional change end diagram it is quite obvious that type 2 corresponds to the ordinary Pavlovian conditioned reflex. Type 1 and the appropriate pseudotype represents a phenomenon of habit formation by the method of price and punishment. The problem of the relation between the two the author solves in the following way. The habit can be classified as a conditioned reflex. It is of a different type from the classical one and it is hardly possible to reduce the two to one type. Too many important differences separate them. The expressing of habit formation as a distinct form of conditioned reflex is naturally of prime importance, so much more in view of a frequent tendency to state in merely general terms the identification of habits with conditioned reflexes or to proclaim such an identification as a program the drawing up of an exact fundamental pattern lays a foundation for future research and makes it possible to investigate habits according to their basic properties it constitutes a procedure similar to the methods employed by the school of Pavlov it is therefore most important that this first step in the investigation of habits or of similar phenomena to be conducted correctly. If the structural analysis of facts under examination contain some error, further researches may be conducted in an altogether wrong way. In our opinion, Skinner's main lines of analysis are correct. He rightly discriminates two types of conditioned reflex, his type 1 against the classical Pavlovian type and stresses the absence of the signaling function in the former. Nevertheless, the very construction of his type 1 is built up in a faulty manner and is not in agreement with the present state of experimental facts. As we have since 1928 been conducting physiological investigations of the phenomena which in psychology are known as habits we would desire to make on the basis of our findings a critical examination of some of Skinner's statements. To begin with, 
a little remark on terminology for the sake of avoiding confusion of terms. In our first paper, published in 1928, we made a discrimination between the ordinary condition reflex and a new type of reflex, which by all appearance corresponds to Skinner's type 1. That new type we have named the conditioned reflex type 2, since in relation to the classical Pavlovian conditioned reflex it presents a next form of conditioning. We have demonstrated that this reflex type 2 is based on a different cortical mechanism from that of the ordinary reflex and that its mechanism cannot be reduced to one of the Pavlovian conditioned reflex type 1 although it implies the functioning of such. In the paper referred to, we expressed a supposition that other new cortical mechanisms might possibly be discovered in the future and that they would represent further types of conditioned reflex. Accordingly, it would seem to be desirable to change the numeration of types given by Skinner and to call the classical Pavlovian conditioned reflex the reflex type 1 and the new one, the reflex type 2. All the more so, as Skinner himself used such a numeration in one of his former papers, let us now pass to the merit of the case. Skinner builds up a new type of reflex, chiefly making use of his own experimental material. In the following way, an animal has a reflex, S subscript 0, line R subscript 0, Example, an investigatory reflex of pressing a lever upon seeing it. When this reflex is reinforced by food, its strength increases, and when it is reinforced by a stimulus eliciting a defensive response, example, an electrical shock, its strength diminishes. Such a strengthened or weakened reflex constitutes the very new type of conditioned reflex. In addition to that, Skinner introduces a special form of this reflex, the one of pseudo-conditioned reflex, in which the reaction of pressing a lever is associated with some indifferent external stimulus, example, light. The formation of pseudo-conditioned reflex is, according to Skinner, based on differentiation. The animal at first responds exclusively to the lever, but later, as the combination lever plus light is continually reinforced by food while the lever alone is not reinforced the animal learns to press the lever solely or nearly so when the light is present as we see the main point in skinner's conception is that the new type of conditioned reflex is formed from an already existing reflex the strengthening response weakening of the connection being the only acquisition this property is to discriminate the new type from the old one since the latter begins at zero and ends in an entirely new connection to be consistent in application of this discriminative property skinner attempts to explain a special case his pseudo type where this property seems to be absent this is the case when the animal learns to react to a stimulus light formally having no connection with the given response according to Skinner the true stimulus in the pseudo type which elicits a reaction of pressing the lever is not light but the sight of the lever light is supposed to serve here only as a factor determining when the reflex lever line pressing gains in strength Skinner says the response is not principally to the light, but to the lever. The light is only a component member of the whole stimulus, and light line pressing is not legitimately the expression of the reflex. To bring out the fallacy in Skinner's way of conceiving the structure of the new type of conditioned reflex, let us consider the following experiment as a primary reflex s subscript 0 line r subscript 0 let us choose instead of an investigatory reflex used by skinner a more distinct one the raising of a leg in a dog under weak electrical shock 
a dog is kept in a stand in an experimental camera and every display of reflex s subscript zero line r subscript zero is reinforced by food falling in line with skinner we should expect as a result of reinforcement an increase of strength in reflex s subscript zero line r subscript zero the electrical shock line raising a leg but what actually happens is that after a few reinforcements the animal starts to raise its leg independently of the electrical shock as soon as it finds itself in the given experimental situation if following Skinner we denote the stimulus value of the experimental situation by S subscript G the above result will indicate the establishment of a new reflex S subscript G line R subscript zero how could Skinner classify this reflex? He could not identify it as his true reflex of the new type since there is no increase of strength in primary reflex as subscript 0, line R subscript 0. Neither could he recognize it as his pseudo reflex since it is not established through differentiation. In fact, the stimulus S subscript G is here not merely a determining factor for the elicitation of R subscript 0 by S subscript 0 but the very stimulus eliciting R subscript 0. To consider the further possibilities of reinforcement we could proceed after the reflex S subscript G line R subscript 0 is just started in two different ways one to reinforce every moment of raising a leg displayed in situation S subscript G or two following strictly Skinner's paradigm to reinforce only those moments of raising a leg which follow the application of electrical shock. In the first case, the animal would learn to raise its leg with maximal possible frequency and the electrical shock would become wholly superfluous. The new reflex S subscript G line R subscript zero would then be fixed in the second case contrary to Skinner's assumption the strength of the response R subscript 0 to the stimulus S subscript 0 would not increase but diminish. The reason for this is that the electrical shock under continual reinforcement soon becomes a conditioned stimulus for food reaction and in consequence its unconditioned defensive reaction according to the law of negative induction becomes inhibited. This matter had been treated in detail in the well-known old experiments of aero fever. Of course, the movements of the leg, which at first started to appear in response to the stimulus as subscript G, would be extinguished as unreinforced. As we see, the mechanism of the new type of conditioned reflex is quite different from what Skinner thinks. The primary reflex as subscript 0, line R subscript 0, does not grow in strength but subsides. In the new type, the stimulus S subscript 0 is replaced by a new stimulus S subscript G. This amounts to saying that an entirely new reflex S subscript G line R subscript 0 is established. What could have caused Skinner's erroneous interpretation, which at first glance seemed to fit facts so easily? The error, it seems, is due to his fundamental experiments not being quite happily chosen. The lever in his experiments plays a double role. On one hand it is S subscript 0 as far as it elicits an investigatory response R subscript 0 pressing. On the other hand it is also a prominent component of the whole experiment situation S subscript G. Since the true mechanism of the new type of conditioned reflex consists as we have shown in the replacement of S subscript 0 by S subscript G, this substitution in Skinner's experiments could not have been noticed since S subscript 0 and S subscript G were represented by the same object. The only effect he could have recorded was an increase in frequency of pressing the lever, a fact which he erroneously attributed to the increase in strength of the investigatory reflex. The mere fact of increase in frequency is quite natural.
if we remember that any investigatory reflex on account of its general property to become easily extinguished is normally displayed rather rarely while the new reflex s subscript g line r subscript zero is reinforced by food shows continued existence it is to be pointed out that the stimulus s subscript zero plays only a subsidiary role in the formation of a conditioned reflex of the new type it serves only to bring about the new response r subscript zero and once the connection s subscript g line r subscript zero is established it loses any further experimental significance what is more the moment r subscript zero may be brought about not necessarily by way of reaction to some stimulus but simply by mechanical means as a passive moment example when the experimenter lifts a dog's leg it would be of interest to mention here one of our experiments analogous to those of skinner in that experiment the passive striking with a dog's leg at a lever has been used as a movement r subscript zero the dog in relation to the liver displayed none of the investigatory reflexes and never would have come to the point of striking the liver had not this been artificially brought about after reinforcing this passive movement by food we brought it about that the dog started to strike the lever by himself there the lever acted exclusively as a prominent part of the stimulus as subscript g the stimulus as subscript zero was entirely lacking since the moment r subscript zero was passive it is not our task to present here the full mechanism of the formation of conditioned reflexes of the new type this matter has been discussed by us elsewhere we shall confine ourselves only to those points which pertain to the explanation of the phenomena taking place in skinner's experiment when in a given experimental situation s subscript g the movement s subscript zero brought about by one of the following ways as a response to the electrical shock as an investigatory response or as a passive movement is reinforced by food the first thing to happen is the establishment of a conditioned food reflex to the whole complex of stimuli entering into s subscript g if after skinner we denote food by s subscript one and the unconditioned food reaction by r subscript one the resulting reflex will be a subscript g line r subscript one the so-called situational condition reflex so well known in pavlov's laboratories this phase of conditioning however is transitory the reflex s subscript g line r subscript one cannot be fixed since s subscript g is followed by food only when combined with with r subscript zero as a result differentiation sets in and s subscript g when without r subscript zero becomes inhibited the conditioned food stimulus that remains is the complex s subscript g plus r subscript zero that is the moment r subscript zero more correctly the kinesthetic stimuli aroused by that moment at the background of the experimental situation s subscript g thus in the second phase of conditioning a double effect is achieved on one hand a conditioned food reflex is built up which has for its stimulus a complex of kinesthetic excitations raised by the moment r subscript zero this is r subscript zero line r subscript one on the other hand the experimental situation s subscript g has become an inhibitory stimulus for food reaction giving rise to an inhibitory reflex s subscript g line r subscript one the facts rest so far wholly on the laws of pavlovian conditioned reflex but as our experiments have brought on in the second phase of conditioning a certain new phenomenon occurs which is not considered by the pavlovian laws the specific stimulus eliciting the moment r subscript zero becomes superfluous for the animal starts to respond to the experimental situation as subscript g by the moment r subscript zero in other words a conditioned reflex of a new type makes its appearance its fixation and continued existence depends on food reinforcement when it has ceased to be reinforced by food it is extinguished simultaneously with the extinction 
of the condition foot reflex R subscript 0 line R subscript 1. It can also be differentiated, Skinner's pseudotype being then obtained. As it could be seen, this new type of reflex arises under the following conditions. 1. The movement which constitutes its effects if a condition food stimulus. 2. The stimulus for that movement is an inhibitory food stimulus in a certain phase of inhibition. The universality of this condition has been demonstrated by us in various experiments. The paradigm on page 270 presents the structure of this reflex. Paradigm Original state Line Experimental situation or any external stimulus S subscript G is followed by R subscript 0 produced by unconditional reflex from S subscript 0 or passive movement. Firstly, minus S subscript 1 no food is followed by no reflex. Secondly, S subscript 1 Food is followed by, by R subscript 1. Salivation as an unconditioned reflex result. S subscript G is followed by R subscript 0. Firstly, corresponding to the no food condition, minus R subscript 1. Inhibition by conditioning type 1. Secondly, S subscript 2. Food is followed by R subscript 2. Salivation and directly from the conjunction of S subscript G and R subscript 0. It represents a new type conditioned reflex type 2 and paradigm. Coming back to Skinner's experiments, we can easily see that their results fall in line with our explanation. By virtue of food reinforcement, the experimental situation becomes to a rat a conditioned stimulus for food reaction. Be it continually reinforced, Independently of pressing the lever, it should remain a conditioned food stimulus and no conditioned reflex of the new type could ever be built on it. Since however, by not giving food, save when the moment appears, Skinner makes out of it an inhibitory stimulus and on the other hand, by constant reinforcing pressing movement, he makes out of it a conditioned food stimulus. Both conditions stated by us are fulfilled, and a conditioned reflex of the new type is established. The animal, as soon as it finds itself in the experimental situation, starts to perform the moment of lever pressing as long as this moment is reinforced. When the reinforcement is discontinued, the reflex as subscript G, line R subscript 0, does not return, as Skinner guesses to its former state of an investigatory reflex but becomes extinguished, that is, actively inhibited. Skinner's interpretation of the second B group of conditioned reflexes of the new type is C paradigm 1 is also incorrect. This group embraces those reflexes which are formed under negative reinforcement, example by application of electrical shock instead of giving food, according to him, the strength of such reflexes decreases when faced with actual facts. One can see that there is something more to it. We have shown that under negative reinforcements the movements R subscript 0 as a response is transformed into an antagonistic movement line R subscript 0 while the same movement R subscript 0 as a stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus for a defensive reflex S subscript 1 minus R subscript 1 S subscript I line R subscript I the whole process may be described thus the animal inhibits the movement R subscript 0 which signalizes to him an obnoxious stimulus and makes instead a preventive antagonistic movement line R subscript 0. This shows that negative reinforcement has more complex effect than a mere decrease of strength in reflex S subscript 0 line R subscript 0. It leads to the formation of a new antagonistic reflex. Let us point out one more detail overlooked by Skinner. Speaking of reaction R subscript 0, we used an expression the movement R subscript 0 instead of the response R subscript 0. We did it for the following reason. According to the existing state of knowledge and we dispose of no facts to the contrary, 
the conditioned reflex of the new type. Our type 2 is confined exclusively to striped muscles, while the classical type has no restrictions laid on effectors and includes among them besides striped muscles, smooth muscles and glands. Skinner's imaginary case shows that he overlooks this restriction, saying that a salivary hypothetical reaction to a stimulus different than food, unconditioned, example light, is liable to be increased by food reinforcement. Being a glandular reaction, salivation cannot by any means be made a conditioned reaction of the new type. Skinner's case is not so much imaginary as impossible. In conclusion, we must say that the structure of Skinner's paradigms for the new type of conditioned reflex contains important errors and gaps, yet we must point out once more that his seeking of new forms of conditioned reflex and his attempts to present their fundamental properties with great detail and discrimination are to be applauded. End of On Two Types of Conditioned Reflex Two Types of Conditioned Reflex, a reply to Konorsky and Miller. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Two Types of Conditioned Reflex, a reply to Konorsky and Miller by B. F. Skinner. First published in the Journal of General Psychology, Volume 16, pages 272 to 279. Before considering the specific objections raised by Konorsky and Miller against my formulation of a second type of conditioned reflex, I should like to give a more fundamental characterization of both types and of the discriminations based upon them. Let conditioning be defined as a kind of change in reflex strength, where the operation performed upon the organism to induce the change is the presentation of a reinforcing stimulus in a certain temporal relation to behavior. All changes in strength so induced come under the head of conditioning, and are thus distinguished from changes having similar dimensions, but induced in other ways, as in drive, emotion, and so on. Different types of conditioned reflexes arise because a reinforcing stimulus may be present in different kinds of temporal relations. There are two fundamental cases. In one, the reinforcing stimulus is correlated temporally with a response, and in the other with a stimulus. For correlated with, we might write contingent upon. There are the types that I have numbered one and two respectively. Konorsky and Miller refer to the second as type one, and to a complex case involving the first, see below, as type two. To avoid confusion and to gain a mnemonic advantage, I shall refer to conditioning which results from the contingency of a reinforcing stimulus upon a stimulus as a type S, and to that resulting from contingency upon a response as of type R. If the stimulus is already correlated with a response, or the response with a stimulus, a reinforcement cannot be made contingent upon the one term without being put into a similar relation with the other. That is to say, if a reinforcing stimulus is correlated temporally with the S in a reflex, it is also correlated with the R, or if with the R, then also with the S. It is not possible to avoid this difficulty, which seems to destroy the validity of the foregoing definition, by specifying a kind of temporal relation. If, for example, we should distinguish between the cases in which the reinforcing stimulus precedes S, and hence also precedes R, and those in which it follows R, and hence also follows S, the resulting cases would be close to those of types R and S, but they would not be identical with them, and the basis for the definition would not permit a deduction of the other characteristics of the types. The contingency of the reinforcing stimulus upon a separate term is necessary. It may be noted, therefore, that in both paradigms of conditioning, as previously given, the connection between the term to be correlated with the reinforcing stimulus and another term is irrelevant. 
no connection need exist at the start. In type S, we may use a stimulus, S sub zero, eliciting no observable response, and in type R, a response, R sub zero, elicited by no observable stimulus. For example, the quote, spontaneous flexion of a leg. Or, if a connection originally exists, it may disappear during conditioning. In type S, if S sub zero elicits a definite response, say where S sub zero dash R sub zero is shock flexion, R sub zero may disappear, aerofava, and in type R, if R sub zero is apparently elicited by a definite stimulus, say where S sub zero R sub zero is the same, R sub zero will eventually appear without S sub zero, as Konorsky and Miller have shown. The paradigms may therefore be rewritten as follows. Top line. S sub zero prime, horizontal line to lowercase r. Also from S sub zero prime, downward arrow to S sub one prime, from S sub one prime, horizontal line to R sub one prime, diagonal dashed line from S sub zero prime to R sub one prime. This is type S. Type R. Lowercase s, horizontal line, R sub zero, arrow pointing to S sub 1, horizontal line to R sub 1 in parentheses. Where the arrows indicate the temporal correlation responsible for conditioning, footnote, the uncommon case in which S sub 1 follows S sub 0 is a minor exception to the direction of the arrow, which may be accounted for with the notion of the trace, end footnote. And where the terms written in lower case either A cannot be identified, b may be omitted, or c may disappear. The correlation of the reinforcing stimulus with a separate term is here achieved, and from it the properties of two, and incidentally only two, types of conditioned reflex may be deduced. The differences between the types given in my paper, which need not be repeated here, are no longer useful in defining the types, but they serve as convenient hallmarks. This solution depends upon the statement that there are responses uncorrelated with observable stimuli, a statement that must not be made lightly, but cannot, so far as I can see, be avoided. It is a necessary recognition of the fact that in the unconditioned organism two kinds of behavior may be distinguished. There is, first, the kind of response that is made to specific stimulation, where the correlation between response and stimulus is a reflex in the traditional sense. I shall refer to such a reflex as a respondent, and use the term also as an adjective in referring to the behavior as a whole. But there is also a kind of response which occurs spontaneously in the absence of any stimulation with which it may be specifically correlated. We need not have a complete absence of stimulation in order to demonstrate this. It does not mean that we cannot find a stimulus that will elicit such behavior, but that none is operative at the time the behavior is observed. It is the nature of this kind of behavior that it should occur without an eliciting stimulus, although discriminative stimuli are practically inevitable after conditioning. It is not necessary to assume specific identifiable units prior to conditioning, but through conditioning they may be set up. I shall call such a unit an operant, and the behavior in general, operant behavior. The distinction between operant and respondent behavior, and the special properties of the former, will be dealt with at length in a work now in preparation. All conditioned reflexes of type R are by definition operants, and all of type S, respondents but the operant-respondent distinction is the more general since it extends to unconditioned behavior as well. A formulation of the fundamental types of discrimination may also be carried out in terms of the contingency of the reinforcing stimulus. Discrimination differs from conditioning because the existing correlation cannot be unequivocally established with any one set of properties of the stimulus or response. The effect of a given act of reinforcement is necessarily more extensive than the actual contingency implies, 
and the relation must be narrowed through extinction footnote or negative conditioning this correction may be made throughout and footnote with respect to the properties not involved in the correlation there are three basic types of discrimination one discrimination of the stimulus in type s a s sub one is contingent upon less than all the aspects or properties of s sub zero present upon any given occasion of reinforcement for example let s sub one be contingent upon the pitch of a tone before this relation and not merely a relation between the response and the tone itself can be established responses to tones of other pitches that have been conditioned through induction must be extinguished b s sub one is contingent upon a group of stimuli but not upon subgroups or supergroups for example let s sub a and s sub b be reinforced together but not separately before the relation will be reflected in behavior the responses to either stimulus alone that are strengthened through induction must be extinguished. 2. Discrimination of the stimulus in type R. S sub 1 is contingent upon R sub 0 in the presence of a stimulus S sub D. For example, let the pressing of a lever be reinforced only when a light is on. Before this relation can be established in the behavior, the responses in the absence of the light developed through induction from the reinforcement in the presence of the light must be extinguished. 3. Discrimination of the response in type R. S sub 1 is contingent upon an R sub 0 having a given value of one or more of its properties. For example, let S sub 1 be contingent upon a response above a given level of intensity. Responses of lower intensity strengthened through induction must be extinguished. There is no fourth case of a discrimination of the response in type S. Both discriminations of the stimulus, but not that of the response, yield what I have called pseudo-reflexes, in which stimuli are related to responses in ways that seem to resemble reflexes, but require separate formulations if confusion is to be avoided. Footnote. Not all pseudo-reflexes are discriminative, if we extend the term to include all superficial correlations of stimulus and response. For example, let a tetanizing shock to the tail of a dog be discontinued as soon as the dog lifts its left foreleg. The discontinuance of a negative reinforcement acts as a positive reinforcement, and when conditioning has taken place, a shock to the tail will be constantly followed by a movement of the foreleg. Superficially, the relation resembles a reflex, but the greatest confusion would arise from treating it as such and expecting it to have the usual properties. End footnote. In type S, case B above, given the organism in the presence of S sub A, the presentation of S sub B will be followed by a response. The superficial relation, S sub B dash R, is not a reflex, because the relevance of S sub A is overlooked. Similarly, in type R, the superficial relation between the light and pressing the lever is not a reflex, and exhibits none of the properties of one when these are treated quantitatively. The distinction between an eliciting and a discriminative stimulus was not wholly respected in my earlier paper, for the reflex, lever-pressing, was pseudo. As a discriminated operant, the reflex should have been written S plus lever minus pressing. Since I did not derive the two types from the possible contingencies of the reinforcing stimulus, it was not important that R sub zero in type R be independent of an eliciting stimulus. But the treatment of the lever as eliciting an unconditioned response has proved inconvenient and impracticable in other ways, and the introduction of the notion of the operant clears up many difficulties besides those immediately in question. It eliminates the implausible assumption that all reflexes ultimately conditioned according to type R may be spoken of as existing as identifiable units in unconditioned behavior and substitutes the simpler assumption that all operant responses are generated out of undifferentiated material. 
certain difficulties in experiments upon operants are also avoided. Operant behavior cannot be treated with the technique devised for respondents, Sherrington and Pavlov, because in the absence of an eliciting stimulus, many of the measures of reflex strength developed for respondents are meaningless. In an operant there is properly no latency, except with respect to discriminative stimuli, no after-discharge, and most important of all, no ratio of the magnitudes of R and S. In spite of repeated efforts to treat it as such, the magnitude of the response in an operant is not a measure of its strength. Some other measure must be devised, and from the definition of an operant it is easy to arrive at the rate of occurrence of the response. This measure has been shown to be significant in a large number of characteristic changes in strength. There is thus an important difference between the Konorsky and Miller sequence, shock-flexion leads to food, and the sequence S plus lever-pressing leads to food. The first contains a respondent, the second an operant. The immediate difference experimentally is that in the second case the experimenter cannot produce the response at will, but must wait for it to come out. A more important difference concerns the basis for the distinction between two types. Since there is no eliciting stimulus in the second sequence, the food is correlated with the response, but not with the lever as a stimulus. In the first sequence, the food is correlated as fully with the shock as with the flexion. The Konorsky and Miller case does not fit the present formula for type R, and a divergent result need not wait against it. The case does not, as a matter of fact, fit either type, so long as the double correlation with both terms exists. Conditioning of type S will occur, the shock salivation reflex of aerofava, but there is no reason why conditioning of type R should occur, so long as there is a correlation between the reinforcement and an eliciting stimulus. Nothing is to be gained in such a case. The original sequence operates as efficiently as possible. The case comes under type R only when the correlation with S sub zero is broken up, that is, when a response occurs that is not elicited by S sub zero. The complex experiment, described by Konorsky and Miller, may be formulated as follows. In the unconditioned organism there is operant behavior that consists of flexing the leg. It is weak and appears only occasionally. There is also the strong respondent, shock to flexion, which has more or less the same form of response. In Konorsky and Miller's experiment, we may assume that an elicitation of the respondent, S-R, brings out at the same time the operant, lowercase s-upper-case r, which sums with it. We have in reality two sequences, a, shock-flexion, and b, lowercase s-flexion, leads to food. Here the respondent, a, need not increase in strength, but may actually decrease during conditioning of type s, while the operant in B increases in strength to a point at which it is capable of appearing without the aid of A. As Konorsky and Miller note, quote, the stimulus S sub zero shock plays only a subsidiary role in the formation of a conditioned reflex of the new type. It serves only to bring about the response R sub zero by summation with the operant, and once the connection S sub G dash R sub zero is established, red once the operant is reinforced, it loses any further experimental significance." End quote. The existence of independent composite parts may be inferred from the facts that B eventually appears without A when it has become strong enough through conditioning, and that it may even be conditioned without the aid of A, though less conveniently. Konorsky and Miller seem to imply that a scheme that appeals to the spontaneous occurrence of a response cannot be generally valid, because many responses never appear spontaneously. But elaborate and peculiar forms of response may be generated from undifferentiated operant behavior through successive approximation to a final form. This is sometimes true of the example of pressing the lever. A rat may be found, very infrequently, 
not to press the lever spontaneously during a prolonged period of observation. The response in its final form may be obtained by basing the reinforcement upon the following steps in succession. Approach to the sight of the lever, lifting the nose into the air toward the lever, lifting forepart of body into the air, touching lever with feet, and pressing lever downward. When one step has been conditioned, the reinforcement is withdrawn and made contingent upon the next. With a similar method, any value of a single property of the response may be obtained. The rat may be conditioned to press the lever with a force equal to that exerted by, say, 100 grams, although spontaneous pressings seldom go above 20 grams, or to prolong the response to, say, 30 seconds, although the lever is seldom spontaneously held down for more than two seconds. I know of no stimulus comparable with the shock of Konorsky and Miller that will elicit pressing the lever as an unconditioned response, or elicit it with abnormal values of its properties. There is no S sub zero available for eliciting these responses in the way demanded by Konorsky and Miller's formulation. Where eliciting stimulus is lacking, Konorsky and Miller appeal to putting through. A dog's paw is raised and placed against a lever, and this response is reinforced with food. Eventually the dog makes the response spontaneously. But a great deal may happen here that is not easily observed. If we assume that tension from passive flexion is to some extent negatively reinforcing, anything that the dog does that will reduce the tension will be reinforced as an operant. Such a spontaneous response as moving the foot in the direction of the passive flexion will be reinforced. We thus have a series of sequences of this general form. Lowercase s plus s sub d, touching and flexing of leg, dash r, movement of leg in a certain direction, leads to s sub 1, relief of tension. The effect of putting through is to provide step-by-step -step reinforcement for many component parts of the complete response, each part being formulated according to type R. The substitution of food as a new reinforcement is easily accounted for. This interpretation of putting through is important, because Konorsky and Miller base their formulation of the new type upon the fact that proprioceptive stimulation from the response may become a conditioned stimulus of type S, since it regularly precedes S sub 1. One of the conditions for this second type is that, quote, the movement which constitutes its effect is a conditioned food stimulus, end quote. That conditioning of this sort does take place during conditioning of type R was noted in my paper, but its relevance in the process of type R does not follow. Perhaps the strongest point against it is the fact that conditioning of type R may take place with one reinforcement, where a prerequisite conditioning of type S could hardly have time to occur. Any proprioceptive stimulation from R sub zero acts as an additional reinforcement in the formula for type R. Where it is possible to attach conditioned reinforcing value to a response without eliciting it, the reinforcement is alone in its action, but the case still falls under type R. In verbal behavior, for example, we may give a sound reinforcing value through conditioning of type S. Any sound produced by a child which resembles it is automatically reinforced. The general formula for cases of this sort is lowercase s dash r sub zero leads to stimulation from r sub zero acting as a conditioned reinforcement. I assume that this is not a question of priority. The behavior characteristic of type R was studied as early as 1898, Thorndike. The point at issue is the establishment of the most convenient formulation, and I may list the following reasons for preferring the definition of types given herein. 1. A minimal number of terms is specified. This is especially important in type R, which omits the troublesome S sub zero of Konorsky and Miller's formula. 2. Definition is solely in terms of the contingency of reinforcing stimuli, other properties of the types being deduced from the definition. 3. No other types are to be expected. 
what Konorsky and Miller give as variants or predict as new types are discriminations. 4. The distinction between an eliciting and a discriminative stimulus is maintained. Konorsky and Miller's variants of their type 2 are pseudo-reflexes and cannot yield properties comparable with each other or with genuine reflexes. Two separate points may be answered briefly. 1. It is essential in this kind of formulation that one reflex be considered at a time, since our data have the dimensions of changes in reflex strength. The development of an antagonistic response when a reinforcement in type R is negative requires a separate paradigm, either of type R or type S. 2. That responses of smooth muscle or glandular tissues may or may not enter into type R, I am not prepared to assert. I used salivation as a convenient hypothetical instance of simultaneous fused responses of both types, but a skeletal response would have done as well. The child that has been conditioned to cry real tears, because tears have been followed by positive reinforcement, e.g. candy, apparently makes a glandular conditioned response of type R, but the matter needs to be checked because an intermediate step may be involved. Such is the case of the Hudgens experiment, where the verbal response, contract, is an operant, but the reflex, the word contract, dash contraction of pupil, is a conditioned respondent. The question at issue is whether we may produce contraction of the pupil according to lowercase s, dash contraction, leads to reinforcement, where, for caution's sake, the reinforcing stimulus will not itself elicit contraction. It is a question for experiment. Footnote. I have to thank Drs. Konorsky and Miller for their kindness in sending me a copy of their manuscript, which has made it possible to include this answer in the same issue. End footnote. End of Two Types of Conditioned Reflex, A Reply to Konorsky and Miller. Chapter 8 Classics in the History of Psychology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Weiskel. Classics in the History of Psychology. Kenneth B. Clark and Mamie K. Clark. Chapter 8 The Development of Consciousness of Self and the Emergence of Racial Identification in Negro Preschool Children. Kenneth B. Clark and Mamie K. Clark. 1939. First published in Journal of Social Psychology, SPSSI, Bulletin 10, 591-599. Speculations concerning the nature of the self and the development of consciousness of self have long been a significant part of psychology. Little experimental research has been done, however, in an attempt to raise this problem out of the maze of speculative conjectures. Paget, elaborating upon Baldwin's concept of a three-stage development of personal consciousness, transitions from a projective to a subjective to an ejective sense of personality, the final ejective stage being the social self, wherein the child is aware of the fact that other people's bodies have similar experiences to his own, maintains that the child comes to discover himself through a progressive comparison of his own body with other people's bodies. Concerning the psychical qualities of self, he states, in the same way, with regard to psychical qualities, it is by imitating other people's behavior that the child would discover his own. Lewin emphasizes the formation of the concept of property as a feature of the development of self-consciousness. The I, or self, is only gradually formed, perhaps in the second or third year. Not until then does a concept of property appear, of the belonging of a thing to his own person. G. W. Alport, on the other hand, speaks of an earlier consciousness devoid of self-reference, while self-consciousness develops only after the age of four or five years. Until the child has a fairly definite conception of himself as an independent person, he cannot conceptualize his relationship to the surrounding world and hence lacks the subjective nucleus for the development of his own personality. Even at the age of four or five, the self is by no means firmly encapsulated. The advent of self-consciousness is gradual and his growth continues, but a certain critical stage is reached around the age of two its symptom is a period of negativism. Some experimental work on the problem has been done, 
Bain made daily observations and records of a child's speech in normal family situations from birth to one and one-half years. From an analysis of the self and others, words of the child, he concluded that self is social. It appears and develops rapidly and observably from five months on and begins to be verbalized after about the first year. Bain said of the child, it is out of his responses to others that his consciousness of self arise, together with appropriate verbal symbols for naming it. The I is a social concept. It is quite different from the concept of self as an object which arises much later. Good enough. Assuming the use of the first personal pronoun to be evidence of having reached a primitive stage in the development of self-awareness, study the use of certain specified pronouns by children in free play and control situations. Pronouns of the first person singular were used with far greater frequency during free play with other children than in the controlled situation. The same trend was shown for the possessions my and mine. Insofar as the use of these pronouns is indicative of something in the nature of an ego consciousness, it is evident this feeling is brought to the fore in the more competitive situations of group play far more frequently than is the case during the less socialized conditions of the controlled situation. Marino's study is of interest in that it approaches the problem of the development of consciousness of self from the point of view of the dynamics of group development. He used a sociometric test wherein children chose from pictures of various racial groups the boy or girl whom they would like to have sit on either side of them. First and second choices were given. Moreno found that gradually from the first grade on, the group develops a more differentiated organization. From about the fifth grade, a greater number of Italian children began to choose Italian neighbors. A larger number of white children reject colored children. It indicates the beginning of a racial cleavage. Attacking the problem of consciousness of self from the point of view of determining the spatial localization of the self, E. L. Horowitz found that he was unable to present a final statement describing where the self actually is. He concludes that the localization of the self is not the basic phenomenon one might hope for to ease an analysis of the structure of the self and personality. More recently, R. E. Horowitz has been concerned with the problem of children's emergent awareness of themselves with reference to a specific social grouping. Her study dealt with race consciousness conceived as a function of ego development. Her procedures described in detail because of its similarity to the one used in the present study. Two picture techniques were used with 24 children from 2 to 5 years of age. A. Choice test. One pair of photographs for boys and girls respectively, showing a white child and a negro child. One pair of line drawings, showing a white boy and a negro boy. One set of four line drawings, showing a white boy, a negro boy, a chicken, and a clown. Boys were asked in each case to identify themselves. The form of the question was, show me which one is you, which one is, using name of the subject. The girls after having identified themselves in the first item, were asked to identify brothers or cousins in the three boys' items. B. The Portrait Series Ten portrait pictures were exposed one at a time. Children were asked, Is this you? Is this? Using name a child. This latter technique did not give as satisfactory results as the first. In the choice test, Horowitz found that 68.4% children were correct and 31.6% were incorrect. In the second series of line drawings, more errors on the whole were made, but the balance of errors was weighted in the same direction. In the third series of this technique, four of five Negro boys made correct identifications and three out of seven white boys made correct identifications. The general limitations involved in the small number of cases are recognized by the author. She states, Further work will, of course, have to be done to determine how common it is and within what framework of circumstance it operates. The Problem The present study is an attempt to investigate early levels in the development of consciousness of self in Negro preschool children with special reference to emergent race consciousness. The term consciousness of self may be considered as awareness of self as a distinct person, as distinct from other groups of things or individuals. The term race consciousness is here defined as consciousness of self as belonging to a specific group 
which is differentiated from other groups by obvious physical characteristics. It is hereby assumed that race consciousness and racial identification are indicative of particularized self-consciousness. Procedure A modification of the Horowitz picture technique was used. There were three sets of line drawings as follows. Set A, one white boy, one colored boy, a lion, and a dog. Set B, one white boy, two colored boys, and a clown. Set C, two white boys, one colored boy, and a hen. Combining all the line drawings, there were four white boys and four colored boys. Each of the four pairs of white and colored boys was alike in every respect, save skin color. The same white and colored boy never appeared in any one set of the pictures. Materials and instructions were presented in the same manner as in Horowitz's investigation. Show me which one is you, which one is blank, using name as subject. With girls, show me which one is blank, using name of brother, boy cousin, or boy playmate. Subjects were examined individually. Subjects 150 Negro children in segregated Washington, D.C. nursery schools, 75 male and 75 female, 53-year-old, 54-year-old, and 55-year-old children. These children were taken from five WPA nursery schools, one private nursery school, and one public school kindergarten. Results Table 1 presents the choices of subjects on the total picture series. On the entire series of pictures, the total group of 150 Negro. Table 1 Choices of Total Group on Picture Series Line Drawings of Colored Boy Number of Choices 225 Percentage of Choices 50.9 Line Drawings of White Boy Number of Choices 195 Percentage of Choices 44.1 Line Drawings of Irrelevant Being Lion, Dog, Hen, or Clown Number of choices, 22. Percent of choices, 4.9. Children made more choices of the colored boy, 50.9%, than of the white boy, 44.1%, CR 2.13. This table, however, is meaningless from a genetic point of view in that all age groups are combined. A mass presentation of the data completely disguises any factors which may be operative in the dynamics of self-consciousness and racial identification. It is apparent that there is a consistent increase in the differences between choices of colored and white boys with age. The significance of these differences increases thus, negative 2.7% at the three-year level, CR 0.4, to 10.9% at the four-year level, CR 1.87, to 12.1% at the five-year level, CR 2.08. These differences are in favor of the colored boy. Table 2. Choices of age levels. 3 years. Line drawings of colored boy. Number of choices, 61. Percentage, 41.2%. Line drawings of white boy. Number of choices, 65. Percentage, 43.9. Line drawings of irrelevant. Number of choices, 22. Percentage, 14.7. Choices of age levels, 4 years. Line drawings of colored boy. Number of choices, 81. Percentage, 55.4. Line drawings of white boy. Number of choices, 65. Percentage, 44.5. Choices of age levels, 5 years. Line drawings of colored boy. Number of choices, 83. Percentage, 56.0. Line drawings of white boy. Number of choices, 65. Percentage, 43.9. The absolute number of choices of colored boy increases from the 3-year level of 41.2% to the four-year level 55.40%, CR 2.44, and slightly again at the five-year level, 56.00 slash zero, CR 1.03. The number of choices of the white boy 
remain approximately the same as the three, four, and five-year levels. Choices of the lion, dog, clown, and hen constitute 14.7% of the total responses at the three-year level, but disappear at the four-year level and do not appear again at the five-year level. The increase in the percentage of choices of colored boy is at the expense of choices of the less relevant pictures of lion, dog, clown, and hen. Thus beginning at the four-year level, these children cease to identify themselves in term of the animals or the clown and consistently identify in terms of either the colored or white boys with a trend toward more choices of the colored boy. The most significant aspect of the results presented in this table, Table 3, is the fact that the choices of the boys show significant trends whereas those of the girls seem to approximate chance. This fact can be best understood if it is remembered that the boys were making identifications of themselves, while the girls were identifying brothers, cousins, and in a few instances a boy playmate. Because of this difference in response, it would appear that either the technique used in this investigation has greater validity when used with boys than when used with girls, or that the dynamics involved when girls identify someone other than themselves is quite different from the self-identification of the boys. Table 3 Choices of the Sexes at Each Age 3 Years Line Drawings of Colored Boy Male Number 23 Percentage 31.5 Female Number 38 Percentage 50.2 Line Drawings of White Boy Male Number 37 Percentage 50.7 Female Number 28 Percentage 37.4 Line Drawings of Irrelevant Male Number 13 Percentage 17.6 Female Number 9 Percentage 12.2 Four Years Line Drawings of Colored Boy Male Number 45 Percentage 60.8 Female Number 36 Percentage 50.0 Line Drawings of White Boy Male Number 29 Percentage 39.1 Female Number 36 Percentage 50.0 Five Years Line Drawings of Colored Boy Male Number 46 Percentage 63.0 Female Number 37 Percentage 49.3 Line Drawings of White Boy Male Number 27 Percentage 36.9 Female Number 38 Percentage 50.6 In view of the fact that the reason for this difference is at present unknown, it is necessary to compare the choices of the boys alone with the choices of the total group. For choices of the colored boy by the males alone at each age level, there is a consistent increase in these responses with age from 31.5% at the three-year level to 60.8% at the four-year level to 63% at the five-year level. This is in agreement with the general trend of results found for the total group. For choices of the white boy by the males, there is a consistent decrease in these responses with age from 50.7% at the three-year level to 39.1% at the four-year level to 36.9% at the five-year level. For the total group, however, there is no such consistent decrease in the choices of white boy. An examination of Table 2 will show that for the 3, 4, and 5-year level, the percentages of choices of the white boy are respectively 43.9, 44.5, and 43.9. This stability is obviously due to the non-differential responses of the females. Discussion It is clear-cut from the results that a definite delimitation of the self on the part of these children 
occurs between the three- and four-year age levels. The dropping out of irrelevant choices of the lion, dog, clown, and hen indicates the attainment of a developmental level where consciousness of self is in terms of a distinct person. This is undoubtedly a precursory level of development to the consciousness of belonging to one group as distinct from another. This latter contention appears to be justified by the increase in the number of choices of colored boy over white boy with age on the part of the total group, and is shown even more clearly in results for the males alone. The dynamic aspect in this development of self-consciousness is even more apparent if one conceives of this increase in the number of choices of colored boy over white boy with age to be an indication of the emergence of the still higher level of personal race consciousness. The fact that definite age trends and increased choices of colored boy were evident from the three-year to the four-year level but, while continuing the trend, were not as definite, statistically significant, from the four-year to the five-year level indicates the probability that this technique is inadequate when used with higher age levels. An alternative explanation of this finding would assume that it is an indication of the facts as they are, that the greatest, most significant amount of development in self-consciousness and racial identification occurs between the third and fourth years. After the fourth year, there is relatively little development of the mechanism operative. Obviously, this explanation would assume that the ceiling had been approached if not actually reached. There must be a ceiling but the data and incidental experiences of the investigators do not seem to warrant the assumption that the ceiling had been reached in this study by the technique used. In support of this belief is the fact that few of the five-year-old children refuse to identify themselves with any picture, saying, I'm not on there, or that's not me, or I don't know them, etc. Some were hesitant, evidently because they thought the same. Some five-year-old said before making identifications on the first set of line drawings, this is a white boy, this is a colored boy, this is a lion, and this is a dog. These responses gave an inkling of the fact that these five-year-olds were developing ideas of themselves as intrinsic individuals. It appeared to be a conflict with this idea for them to identify themselves with either the white or the colored boy just as most of the three-year-olds and all of the four-year-olds had not identified themselves with any of the irrelevant drawings. A more refined technique, which would be as sensitive for the five-year-olds as this one is for the three- and four-year-olds, would undoubtedly yield more valid information concerning the operation of this mechanism in the older children. Identification of self from line drawings seems to be too great an abstraction of an emergent concrete entity for the five-year-old boys. The hesitancy in interpreting self in terms of the line drawings, but rather conceiving of it as intrinsic, concrete entity, is suggestive of another stage in the development of self-consciousness. The fair degree of significance of the male responses and the seeming chance responses of the female indicate that the line drawings used in this study should have been used exclusively with males for greater validity. Line drawings of girls should have been used with the girls. The dynamics involved in identification of a brother or cousin on the part of the girls is obviously different from those in identification of oneself. Further data on the problem will appear in a later paper. Summary and Conclusions In an effort to get some indication of the nature of development of consciousness of self in Negro preschool children, with special reference to emergent race consciousness, 150 Negro children in segregated schools were shown a series of line drawings of white and colored boys, a lion, a dog, a clown, and a hen, and asked to identify themselves or others. The results were as follows. The total group made more choices of the colored boy than of the white boy. The ratio of choices of the colored boy to choices of the white boy increased with age in favor of the colored boy. Choices of the lion, dog, clown, and hen were dropped off at the end of the three-year level, indicating a level of development in consciousness of self where identification of oneself is in terms of a distinct person rather than in terms of animals or other characters. The seeming chance responses of the girls warrants further study of girls making identifications of themselves on similar line drawings of girls. The fact that the sharpest increase in identifications with a colored boy occurred between the three- and four-year level and failed to increase significantly at the five-year level 
suggests that either this picture technique is not as sensitive when used with five-year-olds as when used with three- and four-year-olds, or that a plateau in the development of this function occurs between the ages of four and five, or that the five-year-olds have reached a stage in self-awareness which approaches a concept of self in terms of a concrete, intrinsic self less capable of abstraction or external representations. References 1. Allport G.W. Personality A Psychological Interpretation New York, Holt, 1937 Pages 159 through 166 2. Vain R. The Self and Other Words of a Child American Journal of Sociology, 1936, 41, 767-775. 3. Baldwin, J.M., Social and Ethical Interpretations in Mental Development, New York, Macmillan, 1897, page 7. 4. Good Enough, F.L., The Use of Pronouns by Young Children, A Note on the Development of Self-Awareness, Journal of Genetic Psychology, 1938, 52, 3 3 3 5. E.L. Spatial Localization of the Self, Journal of Social Psychology, 1935, 6, 379-387. 6. Horowitz, R.E. Racial Aspects of Self-Identification in Nursery School Children, Journal of Psychology, 1939, 7, 91-99. 7. Lewin, K. Dynamic Theory of Personality, New York, McGraw-Hill, 1935, page 106. 8. Moreno, J. L., Who Shall Survive? Washington, D.C., Nervous and Mental Disease Publishing Company, 1934, page 61. 9. Piget, J., The Moral Judgment of the Child, New York, Harcourt, Brace, 1932, page 393. End of chapter 8. Recorded by Kelly Weiskull.